regular packet of heat. So I know Mark. coming? Am I he's not. No, okay. he's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're, we got somebody in the back. All right, we'll call the Finance Committee to, to order July 31st. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the new members. Um, glad to have you here. We'll have a full house tonight, all night, once Mark gets here, and that's great. So, Ed Ross, uh, Andrew McLaughlin, we was introduced to us last time, but now I can officially welcome to Sean because he's a sworn in member. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> joined us last time, just didn't have a chance to get sworn in, right. so couldn't vote. But uh, now you're Thank you. now you're not a wooden puppet. You're a real, <laughs> you're a real boy. <laughs> so, so welcome. Glad to glad to have everybody on board. Board, and um, thank you for coming out tonight in the middle of the summer. We do have a, a pretty robust agenda, so it should be some good conversation. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, so the first order of business is reorganization, and then the second order is liaison assignments. Um, so it's a good opportunity to make Mark Malt chair and give him all the, <laughs> all the assignments. Yeah. <laughs> Um, second. Yeah. So um, now we'll start with just traditionally the first uh, first meeting of the, the new year. By the end of July, we were organized, and so uh, that's first on the agenda. Um, so I don't know how this works. I've never led a reorganization as chair, but I think you just open it for nominations for yeah. for Thank chair. Yeah. Let's start with the question: Are you willing to stand as chair? I, I am willing. Welcome the committee making additional nominations for consideration. Okay. I'll just to cover it, I will nominate Eric. <laughs> Second. Okay. Any other nominations for chair of the finance committee? I know Paul is not. <laughs> We've been, over this, the room. been down this road before. So, really? <laughs> no one even wants to nominate Mark? Should we? It's all right. I guess we vote. Is that the idea? Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor for Eric Burkhardt as chair of the Finance Committee. I appreciate your vote of confidence. Seriously, you did I'm not kidding. You did great. Thank you. Even Kaylee, you've been sent to ask you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, Sincerely. look forward to serving the role again. Look forward to working with everybody here. So, thank you. Um, Second order of business as part of this agenda item is the nominate of vice chair, I think, right? So um, we welcome nominations for vice chair of the finance committee. Who's our outgoing vice chair? Was it Mark? It was. Yes. Yeah. What the, what's that what's that entailed with the vice chair? <clears throat> Um, Doesn't I mean, it mean like if you're not here the meeting? There's, there's yeah. definitely some of that, and and that will be true, right, for this situation. I, mean, I know I'm going to miss the first finance forum and a few meetings throughout the year yeah. uh, with travel. So there, part of it is just, uh, you know, uh, helping to run the meetings, helping to certainly contribute. But that's everybody. But then stepping in as chair uh, in the event the chair is absent. Mm -hmm. So, so Paula, you've been. You've been I was gonna say she's chair and vice chair before. Are you are you open to I'm open. All in all, I'll nominate Paula. Second. Thank you. Any other nominations for vice chair of the finance committee? So I think it's a vote now. All those in favor of Paula Perry as vice chair of the finance okay. committee. Awesome. It's unanimous. And I'll take a minute to say I'm certainly glad Paul is here. We've had a, a lot of turnover recently, which is which is great. It's good to have a lot of new faces and people willing to contribute, but um, it's also really good to have a lot of experience on this committee. So thank you to Paul. She's rock solid. Um, is there anything else? Do we, do we do any other position? We don't do secretary. I don't think so. Okay. Everybody tell Mark that he's chair when he comes in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> just to see the look on his face, yeah. right? <laughs> we just look to him we'll to lead the next agenda item whenever he wants. Congratulations. I'll hand him this and I'll stand up. Good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. 
Uh, second order of business is liaison assignments. Everybody has a printed out packet. Great. Um, so, bless you. This was on the agenda last time. Uh, we had five me voting members present at that time. So we decided to table it just so we weren't assigning people to things without, yeah, right. So, um, so um, it's on the agenda here. And just a quick note on liaison assignments. You, you have in front of you, I think the assignments were, I think this is last year, but I'm not sure, I don't know if Bob did this or who did it. It's got Ed's, Andrew's, and Sean's name on here. Maybe just replacing the prior three. Hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Yeah. Um, so just in general, a liaison to a, a different committee is just, just our touch point to that committee, right? It, it does not necessarily mean you have to go to all the meetings, um, although it could be helpful to attend some, depending on the, the committee or the board and depending on the situation. Um, it's also just, you know, um, a touch point from that committee to us, right? So they would know that, you know, for example, the library uh, committee would know that they've got a contact on the finance committee that they could, you know, engage with with you know, any questions or any any conversations finance related. So it's just it's just a touch point. Um, I guess I'd recommend, you know, if whatever assignments you get, just kind of maybe reach out to the chair of that committee and make an introduction, maybe attend a meeting or two. And, you know, as you look through here, I think the ones that that are, are important are certainly they're all important but you know from an engagement perspective from in terms of frequency and, and attending the meetings I would say the select board the school committee potentially the library committee um, I don't know if you'd add any to that certainly again they're all important but um, but those tend to take a little more time right so yeah, I did see this yeah. sheet that's great thank you yeah that yeah so this, Jackie did. <laughs> Jackie, this that's this is very helpful. Great. Very helpful. Yeah. I should have tested that previous years because yeah. that helps you to. So you, you get a good sense of all the committees and then kind of the frequency and, and the regular kind of day that they meet. Um, a great idea just to reach out to that chairperson because often you're sort of getting engaged when they need you to, some of the you know, departments. Yeah. Now, uh, this list that Jackie put together, are they all represented on the first page? I don't know if we've got assignments into all of those. Are they, are they all there? No. Council on Aging and... Some are groups. So it'll be public services? Yeah, public services. Oh, yeah, I see how it is, yeah. Okay. All right, so public services would entail... Again, all that, which, which is not a lot, right? But um, potentially. You know. Just in terms of historical engagement, but yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So, um, again, what's listed there now is not necessarily the way it needs to be, but um, I guess how we might do this is just ask, is there any board or committee that you would want to be a liaison with? And if it's something you like, let's, let's do that, so anybody. Uh, so I'd like to stay on select board. I tend to go to those meetings anyway. Okay. Um, and I need off of library because I can never do Mondays, which I learned after I was assigned as liaison to the library last year. So select board is Sean. And have we typically had more than one on select board? Yeah, we have, uh, well. Two. So we had two and then technically the chair is like sort of automatically by tradition, a liaison to the select board as well. And you got three on here, yeah? Yeah, we do have three now. One was not the chair, but maybe we just made a decision to change oh, for whatever yeah. reason. Mark. Yeah. You got Mark, Dan, and Sean. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to be a liaison to the select board? His chair responsibilities. I wouldn't mind staying on that. Okay, and and you can see traditionally you can be a liaison to two or three, just depending on the, the workload and your time. Like so, permanent building. Yeah. All right. So I'll put Dan on with the permanent building committee. I guess you know just around the room. Anybody you know? I like my preference. If that works. Paula, where are you? Second. No, where is school committee school permanent building? Permanent building and facility. Uh, permanent 
building committee is facilities, I guess. Or no, there's two, two different, yeah, okay. Be happy to take the library from Sean on Mondays is a day that works for me. Library? The, the Tuesdays with the select board. Are okay. Kind of, kind of a non starter. And we have two Sean's, that's great. <laughs> Different spellings. Um, I'd be happy to continue with RMLD. RMLD? Yep. I was going to suggest that. <laughs> um, Karen. Public safety and finance. Um, I, I, I haven't really done anything with them, but I can certainly, like, if we want to reach out and say, hey, I'm a liaison. If you need anything, I'm here. So just mm -hmm. for the It's not numbers. like the board or anything, but they meet regularly. Like yeah. Yeah. I, I was public good. safety so one year. school committee well, with, like, something so that doesn't meet, like, all the time? So you're, you're in school committee again? <laughs> no, no. Thank you. Good. Well, and honestly, we will all be at those school committee meetings, like, come February anyway. Yeah. So yeah. don't worry. We're not going to miss it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So Karen, RMLD. Yes. And did you say public safety? It's fine. Safety? The other two are fine. Yep. What were the other two? Uh, it says public safety and finance. Public safety. Yep. You're going to keep those? Yep. That's and fine. finance. All right. Anyone else? I'd like to <clears throat> drop uh, the library, if you don't mind, and go... Um, hey, oh. hey. Uh, the congratulations. Congratulations, buddy. Yeah, That's awesome. Good. Sorry. No, we're here. Oh, I'm here? We did reorganization. Yeah, right. That's the other end of the room. I'm just kidding. That's the case for the designation. I know, that's right. You have more business than that. Sorry about that. Welcome, Mark. How are you? Good. Thanks. Mark, we're um, working through the A's on assignments. Okay. Um, the current ones kind of are listed on the second page of the packet, and, and Jackie has a real nice um, layout on the third page that lays out all the committees and the frequencies and the days they meet and so on and so forth. So we're just getting started here. Sorry, Andrew. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to drop the library and uh, pick up uh, permanent building. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, we've got three there. Um, is that all right with you? Sure. And certainly with Andrew, with your experience, I think that's that's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Eric, I could I could add um, I could add. Are we, where are we in public services? Are we covered. There's a lot of boards there. Yeah, but a lot of <coughs> we we group them, right? Yeah, I'm just saying there are. Eight boards there, yeah. probably six of which are very, are actually very active Public boards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, historically, have we just? I don't know. What, what, I think we, we just could add another liaison. Add a second liaison. We could have two or th potentially three liaisons there and divide it up. Uh, in some sense, I think Gene is our primary touch point. But mm -hmm. you're right, Sean. There are a lot of boards there, a lot of activity. Also remember, a lot of the, those activities are based upon um, town activities and not just related to finance too. So the ZBA is going to be meeting to go over zoning board of appeals items, and it's typically on a very uh, may not need us linear. It's a very linear meeting, yeah. so you may not need to be there. Uh, yeah, so I guess I just you know thinking about things like like recreation committee for instance you know yeah. a lot of our upcoming capital projects are tied to the recreation committee and yeah, that's what they're sure. doing um there might be a call for us to be more active okay. in that. some of these boards well, we've done i think when those I'll projects come up you get assigned to that project separately like when the library I'll project came up they had a liaison to the library building committee separately sure for, so that's yeah, for, you know what i mean so yeah but, but, I, but I, you know i'm talking about like the million dollar three million dollar projects oh, not gotcha. the, okay not the, not the ones that go to the permanent building committee gotcha. and get gotcha. okay you know all that so yeah um I don't know, just a thought. No, it's a good thought. I'll, I'll, so Paula mentioned she... I said I'd share that with you. Okay. Yeah. Figure out okay. Split or just cover. Okay. All right, so um, let's see. I was going by committee. So Sean, right now I've got you with select board. 
public services, right? Uh, that's right. Sean Jacobs, I have you with library, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Paula, we've got you with school, public services, and facility, probably uh, facilities. Dan, Permanent Building Committee, right? Karen, RMLD, and Finance and Public Safety, right? Yeah. Yeah. Same as last time. Wait a minute, I screwed this up. Sean is library. Yeah, this is really helpful. <laughs> Because it's going to be question mark. It was finance area and safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ed, any any preferences at all? No, these sound good. Yeah, okay. Those also sound fine. I mean, if there's a hole, I can I'm, I'm find a, um, you know, whether it's a library or RMLD. I, um, happy to do that as well, but everything seems fine so far. It's sort of a little design. Um, I would, so yeah, audit. Audit in school. Audit school. And now audit has specific responsibilities. Yeah, audit. The chair. Of the uh, this was a pleasant discovery last year that the chair of the finance committee is the chair of the audit committee. <laughs> uh, but they only meet like a couple times a year. Yeah. It's <laughs> cool. Twice. And Sharon's there, so it's a great time. It's a great time. It's not. <laughs> My right, husband's so never out too late. So. <laughs> this is a good yeah. committee. They're very active committee. They ask a lot of questions. So <laughs> we had a good meeting Karen, last should time. Should we have a second on RMLD? Well, I was just gonna say. So yes. did Sean? Sean, did you recuse yourself from RMLD? No, I'm happy to take that. As well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. yeah, that'd be great. So okay. Sean was library and RMLD. I, I do think we should stick the two. Yeah. Yeah. There's a real life town finances issue that comes on in real time there. So. <laughs> Mark, any any preferences? I'm, you know, I'm fine with wet how they are now. If if you need another spot, select more public works. That's fine for All me. Right. So for select board, we do now have one, two, two. Is that right? Am I missing anybody? I think that's right. For select board. Right. I don't know, is Dan, Dan, are you staying on select board or no? Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm okay to stay on. I mean, if you need to move me somewhere else, that's what I was saying. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm good there. I could, so I, all I have is audit so far, so I can take that also. Select okay. board, yeah, all right. So select board is, is me, Sean, Mark. Yep. Just looking at the big one. School, we've got good coverage, I think. Paula, Ed. Sean. No. Paul and Ed. And you, and and you, you, you in that. school? Okay. Because like, you'd yeah. say, okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Um, how many do we have on library? Do we have library? We do. Sean. Yes. We have two at our LD. Sean and Karen. One we, facilities. You probably need one in the library. I think we only had. I mean, I think that's. If, if we only have one, it's probably fine. And we do, right, Sean? I'm bouncing back and forth here between two sheets. Sean on library. Yes. That's it, right? Okay. Yeah, Sean Jacobs. <laughs> yeah. Um, public works, I think we have Mark, and one I think is fine. Public safety, do we have public safety? Mark, I just want to let you know my road still isn't paved. <laughs> Don't complain to me. I'm just kidding. Aaron's on public safety. Isn't there an app for that or something? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be over there anyway, she promised. Like, it's it's anything else you want to join? <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> Your preference. Administrative services. 
Yeah, we could do one there. Yeah, that's right. All right, Dan's that all right? Sure. Administrative services. Jackie, I don't know if you're trying to capture all this. I can send it. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll run it down at the end. Okay. Uh, I think we've got good coverage. Let's run it down one more time just so Jackie's got it. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I'd also like to be on RMLD. Sure. If you don't mind. If I don't mind. There's three for RMLD, but that's okay. It's yeah. fine. I mean, these are all public meetings. Um, yeah. So, if so, there's a good question. If all three of us show up at RMLD, do you have to post meetings for us? No, that's I think so. Okay, good. Okay, okay sorry. Okay, good. You're just used to the fact that we've only had five people for a while. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm just used to the select. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm worried about that. Okay. Yeah. They end up with a quorum at the beaches, just getting coffee. Right. The cabin here. One of us has to leave. <laughs> okay. All right, Jackie, ready? I have audit and select board. Sean Brandt, select board, public services. Dan, permanent building committee, administrative services. Karen, public safety, finance, or MLD. Sean Jacobs, RMLD and Library. Andrew, School, Permanent Building Committee, RMLD. Um, Mark, Select Board and Public Works. Paula, School, Public Services, Facilities. And Ed, School, did I get it right? Yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Next topic of discussion is OPEB and pension overview. So this, I'll be completely honest, this is something that comes up every year in some way, shape, or form. Um, I don't have a good handle on it as I feel like I should. Um, particularly for some of the, the newer people on the committee, but also I think for all of us, I thought it might be a good idea as we start to engage in discussions around these areas to ask Sharon to come in. Thank you for coming in on the evening no uh, to give us a give us an overview of uh, you know, some history, kind of where we stand right now, exactly what these what these things are. And so I'd like to turn it over to Sharon. So I handed out um, kind of the notes of what I'm going to talk about just so that you can reread them later um, in case you don't remember something I said or maybe I don't touch upon something I intended to say. Um, and I also included things in your packet. I'm looking at the packet when it was um, sent out and the pages weren't numbered. So I'm going to refer to the number of pages. You might have to count the number of pages to get there. I apologize. Okay, so I figured I would start with pension because that's the bigger of the two. Um, and a lot of people are under the impression that, you know, our pensions are free and that that don't funds them and really that's not the case. So years ago, about 30, 40 years ago, they did pensions as pay as you go and the employees were, get, you know, uh, contributing very low percentages and so that required the town to be putting in some and they weren't. They were just paying it as it came up. And so that, that accumulated quite a bit of a liability over time and that at some point the state decided to mandate that those liabilities need to be funded. And so every two years, we have an actuarial evaluation done um, to determine what those liabilities are for our retirees and our active members. They come up with a number, and then they look at what you have for resources, and they tell you what your own funded is. They also provide us with a funding schedule to get it fully funded within a certain time frame. The state mandate is that we need to have it fully funded by 2040. Um, and so we're, we're well ahead of schedule. If you look at um, some of the information I'm going to talk about, uh, we are um, scheduled to be fully funded in 2029. Um, and just what you said introductory was interesting. So in theory, based on what you said, um, maybe the actual numbers don't go down, but you're, because now more employees fund their pension, mm -hmm. 
that liability should go down. Yes, and when we look at the funding schedules, I can point out and show you how I much less it ends up becoming. Yeah. So um, currently, employees that work for cities and towns um, are required to put in nine percent of their salary plus two percent of anything over thirty thousand. So you're looking at over ten percent of your salary is going in to fund your pension. They take that money, they invest it, and put it in that. In, in the end, that employee, in most cases, unless they're public safety, are, are they going to fully fund their retirement when they retire? Because what they've actually put in is actually going to be equivalent to what that benefit might be, you know, the present value of that benefit. In some cases, that it doesn't always work out that way. I mean, if somebody goes out on a disability, an, an accidental disability, that certainly would be probably um, a contribution from the town that would need to be made to cover that person's retirement. The ones that will cover most of their retirement, but not all of it, is police, fire, RMLT. They, they retire earlier because of their hazardous jobs, and so they're in retirement longer. It costs more to be in retirement longer, so there's more likely a contribution from the town um, to fund those retirements. Um, so the issue that we're in with the liability that we have is from years, years and years ago of really not funding this as, as it should have been. Um, at, they weren't putting money aside to make sure that money's there when these people retire and then they were just paying as you go. So we're trying to catch up on that. So if you look at the team... It's not going into a pool. Yeah. It's not like like where I'm planning my retirement and it's directly what I'm saving is what I'm going to use for my retirement. This is going into a pool mm -hmm. and that's why I've heard. And they keep track of how much every person puts into it. Um, but it's a defined benefit. So it's a little bit different than, say, a 401k plan. So they yeah. determine what your pension is going to be when you retire. You get that to the date of your death. Whereas if you have money in 401k and you take out too much, you could run out of money. It's a little different in that respect. The same sort of idea, it's a pre-tax coming out of their check and going into the pension to fund their pension. So it's pension reform over the years has kind of brought up those percentages to enough where the contributions from the town are not as much as they used to be. Most, most people will fully fund their pensions with the number of years they have to work to retire. So, and I did do a presentation um, at a select board meeting maybe six months ago, around, I think December it was, um, and it was demystifying the myths so people understood that how that works and what the present value of somebody's retirement benefit is and how much they would have put in over the time that they worked and, and comparing those numbers so that people could visualize and see that they really do, in fact, either cover it almost entirely or completely. Sometimes they don't. They put in more than they actually collect. It just depends on how long they're in retirement. So um, that's important to know because I feel like sometimes if you don't work in an environment where there's a pension, I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not like it was years and years and years ago where people got this as a gimme. <laughs> are really contributing. And so if they don't collect as much as they put in, they're effectively funding others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because it also, they have options at retirement. So um, if it's a defined benefit, so if you decide, hey, I want to um, select option A, that's the highest benefit, and that says that when I pass away, it ends. Nobody else gets anything. If there's anything left in my annuity, it defaults back to the retirement board. Option B is, um, you know, if, when I pass away, if there's anything left in my annuity, it goes to a beneficiary. And af after about 15 years, usually you've exhausted your annuity, so usually there's not a lot there. Um, and, the, you know, if you retire 15 years, it likely won't be anything left to give to somebody. And then um, option C is you get a lower benefit, but if you pass away and you have a spouse, the spouse collects two-thirds of your benefit until their death. So they're really covering two people. And so um, so those are the options, and, the, and they get less if they go with benefits that cover another person or if they're going to give to a beneficiary, whatever's remaining. They get the higher benefit if they're willing to forgo, you know, if the option A, you get with the highest benefit, if you pass away, but nobody else gets yeah. anything. Sharon, you mentioned um, before, like, um, there are certain positions fire police that retire. Like, does that, like, into these funding schedules, does that, you know, those statistics start to get, you know, kind of factored in to the table so that, you know, so... They, they are factored in. They so, all, like, so, you, so when they're, they're getting it, they know exactly who those folks are because they're called group four employees, yeah. So, but like from a funding perspective, so say it turns over, you know, so say we have a, a, a more, you know, kind of a younger police force, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, and then you kind of predict that one, you know, so they would be on the retirement rolls for longer, per se, mm -hmm. if they retire earlier. 
does, could that change our funding? You know, like, there's a lot of assumptions that are being made when they're doing it. It's all estimates when it comes to actuary calculations. But they make assumptions about how long, how, at what age certain um, groups are going to retire, especially you know, fire, police, linemen, those dangerous jobs are expecting them to go out younger than, say, uh, you know, a town manager necessarily. They might be a less hazardous job. And so they estimate how long those people will be in retirement, and they estimate what will that cost us? What is the average? What is it? What do they currently make? By the time they retire, they're, they're extrapolating a certain percentage of increase each year. They're trying to figure out, at retirement, we think they'll probably retire to age whatever. Sure. They'll be at this rate of pay and they'll get a, probably a pension of X. And sure. th so that's kind of what they're doing for every single person is figuring out how long have they been with you already, how old are they, how many years in are they going to have. So there's a lot, it's a very involved calculation that the actuary is doing to, to come up with these liabilities. Down to the type of worker. And they like, also are projecting white -collar, um, they literally call them what your investment purpose. return is going to be because <clears throat> we have our funds at PRIT. Um, so they're trying to say, okay. Did you define PRIT? Sorry. PRIT is the um, Pension Retirement um, Investment Trust, and it's used by the state to fund pensions. Um, and so, and they're billions of dollars are in print. So they have access to investments that smaller investors right. just wouldn't have access to. So we do have some investments that actually have very high yield, I mean, high returns. So private equity being one of them that we see very typically very high rates of return so um, so it has worked out better for us I mean because as a municipality we're limited in what we're able to actually invest in on our own um, being in, you have a team managing these funds um, and they're able to invest in different things that we are not allowed to invest in so it's it's been in place for years we do use print um, we have had a seven so if you look at this page here in your packet I think no, unless they worked in, um, if they their 40 quarters and worked and contributed to Social Security, they have, but they're going to be offset when they retire. That's, never quite That's another thing people don't understand is that if you're a municipal employee and you're collecting a pension um, and you did work for Social and contribute to Social Security and you have your 40 quarters in, um, the way that Social Security will actually calculate your benefit is they take your 35 highest years. Well, if you didn't work 35 years contributing to Social Security, they give you zero. So, so we would think that would be enough to lower the benefit down, but then they go ahead and say, oh, when you have a pension, we can offset you another 400. So they figure out what your benefit would be, and then they can deduct another $400 a month from that person because they have a pension. So it's a little bit like of a double whammy. You would think all those zeros really hurt you because you haven't worked 35 years in Social Security, and then they take it. So that, that's something that I think there's legislation to try and change, but it's also something that if it doesn't affect you, most people don't know. They, some people think you collect both, and you might be able to collect both, but not very much. <laughs> it definitely is. I just don't get why the country, this is a good program, why wouldn't we make it for municipal employees, state employees, federal employees? Why we wouldn't make Social it? Social Security. Why wouldn't we? Yeah, why wouldn't we? Make sure. I and just always think that's, like it was your idea, but it's not good enough. Like it's just such a weird. It is weird that we have the different, yeah. Right. I'm not sure why. Okay. Social Security and the pension or annuity funds are also slightly different, or much different from each other, in the sense of annuity or pension, you can typically choose different for several options. Um, pension's a probably a little bit tighter than um, some of what's called state unions or union annuity, where an annuity, um, that's your money, what you qualify for, that's all of your money and that's what you have. <laughs> um, so the annuity is kind of separate from your retirement accounts or your annuity at any given time. You can touch with your 401k, uh, you can't, mm -hmm. you can, but you can still take a loan out against your 401k. Yeah. You can't really do that um, so on Social Security. Um, so there is a benefit behind having a pension and annuity versus Social Security, especially if you get injured before they reach 35 years. Um, sometimes a um, SSDI, uh, Social Security Disability Insurance, um, you know, and they start pulling from those benefits that they contributed to. So, uh, 
Social Security is great, but if you have a better option. So I think they look at it like you have a better option than most because it's a defined benefit, you're not going to run out of money. Mm -hmm. I think that's like why they do it. I'm just not entirely sure why they, they do it like a double whammy on you because so, they're giving you all those zeros and I can imagine that really greatly reduces what that Social Security benefit is. And then they go ahead and deduct up to $400 more off whatever they come up with, which I think is kind of crazy, but it is what it is. <laughs> but it is something you might see legislation that's trying to change it because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But Chair, real quick, sorry, the presentation to the select board you said was in December? I want to see it was in December. Right. And I have the PowerPoint presentation. I can send it out okay. to you guys. I would ask you for that. Yeah. And, yeah. And I just didn't know what kind of time. Go watch the video and too, they, right? they can watch the video or they can, you know, look because I give examples of this person's age, whatever, in their group one, and, you know, they make a salary of X. And at retirement, this is the this is what their benefit would be. This is how much their, you know, contributions to the retirement system has, have accumulated to. So you can see that they fully fund in most cases. So, so important to know. Um, so really what we are paying back, all this big money that we owe, really has to do with just not funding at all those years ago. And we're just trying to catch up. On this page of your packet, which I think is page four, it's got the chart. This is an annual report from PARIC, and they do a page like this for every community in Massachusetts. PARIC is our Public Employee Retirement Administration Commission, and they oversee all the retirement boards. Um, and so they get data from all the boards every year um, and all their actuary information and such. So they put together this nice page that gives you a lot of great information. You'll notice that they'll give you our funded ratios back to 1988. So you can see the ups and downs. You know, if the market takes a turn, we could have been high and go down. Um, and so it shows you how, how much progress we've made towards being fully funded. You'll also notice that they actually have our investment returns for the last five years, the average for the five years, and then an average average for 34 years. Um, and so you can see in the, over the last five years, we've had three years where we've exceeded our um, estimations and a couple years where we fell short. Fiscal 17, we had almost 18% returns. And then in fiscal 18, we lost 1.39%. We've been um, with print all this time. Yes. Um, it, and so, you know, it's an up and down. But in, in general, um, the average for the five year ended up being 6.57. Um, average for 34 years is 9.1. So there's still long term, we're still making the rates that 9%. Can I, can I ask you a question? So these assets are have to be with the state, correct? This They don't have to be, but it's really a, a great option for municipalities okay. um, because they do have access to investments that we're not allowed to invest in ourselves. Um, sure. And, and because they're managed by, you know, right. people who do this for a living, but, um, but also it's a large portfolio. There's access to things that we would not be able to buy even if we had a team to actually manage our investments. Well, one of the things that makes me nervous when we're looking at this, and you talked about it, is the return-seeking aspect of this. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of engine work, and the return-seeking aspect is the scary part of this. So right now, markets are great. We're getting all these returns. It's the downside of these pension funds that's the scariest thing. So all these projections that we're looking at today, without some strategy around that, so are really do, not worth a lot, just well, because one, it's one the bottom can drop out on you pretty quick. When, one thing that we have recognized is um, Crit is really focused on getting the state fully funded by a certain timeline, and they're less funded than say we are in Reading. So the Retirement Board has taken some action to um, take some of their money out of print and then have more decision making as to where it's it at print, but we decide what to invest yes, in so that we can control our asset allocation and yes. control our level of risk. Um, so that started just this year. We okay. pulled out a certain amount of money and we're investing in different types of sleeves and trying to manage our own um, asset allocation who's over time. Who's uh, helping? Is someone helping you do we that? We are using FIA um, okay. as an investment consultant and they manage they come out every month and give us a, you know, a they send us a packet and I think they come quarterly. Um, okay. So this is a new arrangement because we started to recognize that our risk are a little bit different. We're getting yeah. closer to being fully funded and we don't want to be so risky with our investments in the state. I mean, Pritt's going to manage a lot of it trying to get the state there. We're not in the same situation right. we are. So we want to try and be able to have a little bit more control over the risk that we have. 
Right, and matching the duration, like you were talking about. If you're gonna, if that's that's the the duration seeking assets are really what you need to have here to, mm -hmm. to get rid of that volatility, and that's what scares me. I mean, these these when you see seven percent in a pension fund, that's actually a scary number, not a great number, yeah. because that means that you're return seeking, and you really, really don't want to be in that. Yeah, and you're taking more risk. And for the town, that means that the bottom drops out on this, and your liability all of a sudden explodes yeah, on you at the wrong that. time when other things happen. I mean, think about the economy, people buy less cars, people do a lot of things that can kind of replenish the banks of the town, and you don't have that at the time where the pension drops out. So yeah, exactly. that's, that. I'll be honest with you, that scared, yeah, scared me a little bit when I saw, yeah, for sure. So we are trying to do, you know, the retirement board is seeking consult from investment firms to try and manage that level of risk. Okay. So, so, sure, sure does it, is there, and I don't know if it's in the back door, like how do we, Peer group wise, you know, like from uh, like, uh, versus other towns, as far as and, and that might have led to the decision for the retirement board to start to you know go this speed route. At the mm -hmm. You know, um, I know you mentioned 2040, we're at 2029. Is that how does that look? Do, do we get statistics or do you get I, if you were to look at the PARC website and for me to print it for you, it would have been a book um, because this is the whole uh, state of Massachusetts. But if you went to their website, you'd be able to find a page similar to this for every community so you could actually compare with every community. We actually are doing quite well towards our um, goal and we, we don't want to lose traction. So that's why we're pulling away a little bit and trying to manage it a little bit more um, to the way we would like and the risk level that we would like. Um, but also too, the less risky the investment you know, your, your returns are a little less. So it, it's it's a balancing act. But you manage to funded status. You stop looking at returns. Like you basically, you every meeting you start talking. Okay, we were eighty percent funded last week, or last quarter. Excuse me. Now we're eighty two percent over seventy nine. Why did that happen? Where where is the mismatch between your liability and your assets? And how why is it not riding at least in concert? Because if, we, if you're throwing cash on top, you should always be up. Right, because you're always throwing a little cash on the way the town is. But if you're not doing that, yeah. that's when it gets. And we are required to fund, so it's mandated. So sure. whatever we funded the prior year, we can never do less than what was funded the prior year. So it's so, you know, okay. every year it's more. Yeah. Um, so that's an important point to make. A couple so. questions here. I'm sorry. So just picking up on Mark's concern, you said, did I hear you right? It's just in the last year or so that you've begun to more actively manage some. The years before we started to, we put a bid out to to get investment consultants to look at okay. um, the performance of print and then whether or not it makes sense to pull some of this money out and you know so we did that bid process that took quite a while and then we you know, heard all of those presentations and we elected FIA and they have just recently pulled money out of print and put them in the different sleeves and so it, it's one of those things where it's very newly being moved around okay. you know? yep. so but our interaction with FIA has been over a year at this point but it's just for the planning okay. stages of what to do um, but also it, our funding schedules are based on trying to get there by 2029 because we also know that we have a very large OPEB liability that needs addressing. Next topic. So we do still need a certain level of return to get there. So there, you know, we can't be completely risk averse because we're not going to get there. Sure. Um, and so we just want to have a little bit more control, a little bit more say. Yeah. Um, that makes me realize. And, and the whole idea um, that we've had in the past is that when we are fully funded and there's that dramatic drop in the assessment for pension because we're fully funded and now it's just what the normal cost would be for you know yeah, every year yeah. and we saw that it's maybe an eight million dollar drop when we're fully funded that some of that money or a good bulk of that money could be redirected towards OPEC and, and very, very quickly get that paid down so we like to hold fast to that 2029 and hope that we don't you know see a, a market crash that's going to bring us back the other way it's just very difficult to know but you still need those returns to get there we're, yep. we're, we're estimating 7.65 percent on the last valuation we just did another valuation as of 1119 and we had an investment return reduced to a cent a half so that she's building it saying you've got to get an investment return at seven and a half percent 
just and then that's where a, a lot of our peers are at. Um, but comparatively, we are doing well. And in our meeting with our actuary, she was just like, these questions are never asked because most of the communities are kicking the can further down the road. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions that we asked were, well, when we're fully funded in 2029, it goes from 11,000 to almost three, you know, less than three. We're going down by like $8 million. Could we leave a little bit more, have the yearly funding be less so that this would be only going up 2.5%, kind of thinking about our levy only going up 2.5%. It's like, I don't know. Nobody's gotten there yet. Like, it's one of those things where we're asking questions that nobody's even thought the answers because we're getting close enough. Um, it's just like these are good conversations to be able to have. Um, but we still may not get there. You just never know. The market fluxes all the time. We're hopeful. <laughs> And you, sorry, you mentioned that, so we're required to, f to contribute and throw cash out every year mm -hmm. and we can't go below what it was prior So year. whatever we're that funding schedule is that we're on, we have to put in um, on the funding schedule or more. Uh, all right, just wondering where we were. And so we can never, like, have a declining schedule until mm -hmm. we're fully funded. Um, and so once, if you were looking at um, these schedules here, if you looked at 2029, you would see that our um, costs go up to 11.6 million, and then in 2030, when we're fully funded, they'd go down to 2.8. And that 2.8 represents the cost, the money that needs to go in to fund those folks that are going to be in retirement longer, those you know, public safety people, RMLT people, people with hazardous jobs that are going to retire much younger and be in retirement hopefully for longer. Um, and so that those are the people who are not going to fully fund, um, but they're going to get close. But, but so th these are the numbers that, and it's all estimates too. Yeah. You know, so how create anything is she putting a bunch of assumptions in here, and not everything works the way she plans. They they even put an anticipated date of death for every person of when they think that the person will live. Average life expectancy. There's so much that goes into this that it's mind-boggling, honestly. <laughs> So, so, so just, just, just one uh, kind of question, <clears throat> and, and again, just some of the thought process and the thing you mentioned about other communities in that, in that conversation, they're kicking the can. Um, is there a happy medium from where we are now and you know, kind of managing what we're doing and extending it out a little bit um, so that, you know, you know, it, from, you know from, from that perspective, is there, you know, an advantage or is there other ways that we could allocate, you know, some of this and have it be 2031 or 2032? We're still in that, you know, still in the ahead of the window, mm -hmm. but then using, you know, if there's other priorities or anything else that we could do that, you know. It's certainly, there's always that possibility. And when we're selecting funding schedules, that's always a thought process. But I feel like the, the main one that we've kind of been going with is get that fully funded status so that a large amount of money is available towards the OPEP funding. Um, and try not to push it out if we can avoid it. And then if we have to, we do, we definitely do. I mean, I think when I started, it was at 2028, and we're at 2029 now. So um, yeah, anything's possible. You, know, you can work the numbers. We can ask the actuary to do different things to bring up this funding schedule in different ways. I know for a long time, um, we were seeing increases year over year, four and a half. And then if things don't work out exactly as she plans, this funding schedule comes up with a big number for the next year. And so you just like, ah. Oh. And then that's when people will push it out. I can't have a number that big go into my budget. We don't have that kind of flexibility. And that's the kind of, you know, the balancing act that typically happens that will force somebody to push it out. They don't get the returns that they projected or or um, different assumptions come in different than they had thought. You know, if, if people were living longer um, than what was expected or um, or the increases um, in their pay are higher than she assumed and just all sorts of things that change the overall numbers every two years when she's doing it. It changes what everything looks like in terms of what needs to be contributed each year. So every two years we do it so that the, for the financial statements we know what that unfunded liability is that needs to be reported and then a funding schedule that matches is, is coinciding and they can push it out. They just take that into from the retirement board what you want to do. And the retirement board, I'm on the retirement board and the ex officio. I always consult with Bob because I never want to make anything painful for the town. I want to make sure that whatever we do select makes sense and isn't going to crunch other areas. Um, as it worked out for this particular um, actuary evaluation that happened at 1-1, um, we 
had several funding schedules, and I sat with Bob because it happens that we have some savings and health insurance because of a lot of changes that he had made in terms of getting people who are over 65 on MedEx. Um, and it's changed our risk pool for our HMOs and PPOs and made our, our health insurance less expensive than was anticipated. So that savings can be redirected into pension, and that one year jump that we're going to see isn't going to hurt so bad because he has it already there from this, you know, this savings that he was able to generate by doing this risk pool adjustment that he had done. And so that being the case, like when you look at um, one of these schedules, <laughs> this is the funding schedule that the actuary came up with. Bob selected one year in 2021, it could go up up to 21%, of 21.27% or 25.52%. And the difference between the two is that the retirement board is going to request a COLA-based increase for the retirees. So the way that this works is, yeah. I just want to ask a question to hit also what Ed was saying, but before you go too, too deep into the uh, COLA, which I believe is also really on the other packet as well. Um, this is all strictly based upon a large jump between 20, 20, 2020 to 2021. Mm -hmm. So yes, granted, if we go strictly off of percentages, if we look at the pool, um, say we use that pool to make a percentage jump, whether it be 20, 21, or 25, um, that's now, right? So we have that now. Mm -hmm. But 5% on top of 25% for the following year doesn't necessarily mean in 21, 22, 23 that we have that difference between 19 because this isn't the number. That our, additional our budget is built off the base that 21% or 25% mm -hmm. is the new base from the prior year, and then we increase that number by 5%. So the way the budget is built, it's built on what your base was from the last year. And so a 5% increase is, you know, so he's saying you're taking a hit in the one year and now you've built up your budget for that line item to that, that level and then the next year. We right, the instead of doing smaller mm -hmm. increments of it. And he's um, utilizing a savings that we recently um, were able to acquire by, you know, taking people who are, who are over 65 who are not in Medicare and working hard to get them into Medicare so that we can cover them under MedMass, which is a cheaper um, option for the town, much, much cheaper than Blue Cross Blue Shield HMOs and PPOs. And, and then also the demographics of our membership is younger people under 65 and so we get better rates. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, you know, I don't even know how he conjured up all of this, but, but this is, is what he did. Reality point in real dollars, and out the years we're paying more different bases, higher. Mm -hmm. So it, right. 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 it's going to take more the budget. Yeah, yeah right. it, but it's but it's for front loading it um, into yeah. one year, taking them at that big hit in that one year, and then building up. And when all the savings would have been in health insurance, and it's it's not going to be. It's just shifting that budget between more items. You know, we, we usually have a seven eight percent increase in health insurance budgeted every year, and then get a negative number because you did something like this. Now next year you could have gone up seven or eight percent, and you've got this money that probably would be enough for that year. Do you know what I mean? So that seven or eight percent can be reality. Allocated. Um, so, very strategic m move made by Bob to, to make that switch to try and contain health insurance costs that are so growing at such a rapid pace. And it could provide us an opportunity to do this funding schedule, front loading a lot of cost into 21 and getting us closer to you know being fully funded with only a 5% increase. I'm sure I get a little confused. I thought once made a contribution, we couldn't do anything less. So we can because it doesn't go if you look at it even though you go down 25 you go, it's like the first one that's 25.52 percent the next yeah. year it goes up by five percent yes yeah, so you have to, got to at least oh, do the same absolute dollars yep. yeah okay. just plus that's kind of what i was getting at yeah. as well as five percent on each in number from the previous year it's compounded essentially compounded over, interest. over the last several years we've been increasing four and a half so this five percent is closer to what we've been doing um and so taking this hit in 2021 one gets us closer to what we've been used to doing a five percent increase four to five percent increase every year on that assessment to get us there but keep in mind every two years we do this valuation and if things don't work out the way they plan you just never know they could push out but the intent is to try and get us there and that's, that's mm -hmm. what we're trying to do 
So I did um, point out this um, chart, and it's really good to study because it tells you a lot about our retirement system. At the time that um, they did this valuation, they were using the 1117 valuation, which is the older one. We are in process for 1119, so we have more updated data in, in this packet, but they had us at 73.8%. If you turn a couple pages in your packet, you'll see the numbers coming from KMS for the 1-1, one, one. Um, and, and we're going to a 76.8% funded. Uh, we're going from a 45.4% um, unfunded library to 42.9. So we are making headway, you know, slowly but surely, um, but in the positive direction. And the other thing, as I was mentioning about the COLA, I think I kind of went off topic there, but if you look at the page before that, there's actually some data comparing the two act actuary evaluations, and it talks about what the average pension is. And in the, the most recent valuation done on January 1st, 2019, the average pension is 32,191, and in the prior one, it was 29,988. So that just strikes me as, a lot of people have some fairly modest pensions. They're not these large numbers. I'm sure there are people that get large pensions, but the majority are very modest pensions. And so the way it works when we do a COLA increase um, for retirees is we'll give them 3% up to the first $12,000. So that means the increase for the year is $360. That's not a lot. <laughs> and so what the retirement board has proposed is to ask town meeting to bring that COLA base up to $14,000. So they would give them 3% up to $14,000, bringing it up to $420 a year. Not a lot of money, but you can see that these people are getting very modest pensions and it has not been increased since 1988 or something. Um, other communities are making these switches. Like Winchester just went to 14,000. So it is movement that you're seeing across other communities as well. And it's just something that the retirement board is going to ask for. You're saying that's coming up? It's going to be on the I November thought we did, I thought we did. That. We did have it on the agenda and FinCon did not support it and we tabled it. I think that was pre -over. And it was pre override. It was just yeah. a hard, it was a hard timing. It, the timing was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, they had made the decision to want to go for it not knowing that the override was coming and then it was on the agenda so around the time frame we were yeah. year before yeah. an override, you know, way it was going to go. Um, so if it does pass the $14,000 polo base, you'd be looking at Schedule N for fiscal 21. If it fails, you'd be looking at Schedule K. So Schedule K, it would go up 21.27%. What'd you say? I'm shocked it throws it up. It's amazing that because you know, over time they're getting it every year for you know it actually does bring up the liability by I want to say it's like 1.8 million dollars overall, um, but I guess they feel like the movement is, is going that way in other municipalities, other communities are doing the same change, and we do have very modest pensions. And so I think at the last time we put this together for the town meeting warrant, we had a chart that showed you how many fell in each in each income group, and it's shocking how many are in the very low end. So, so to see how it goes at town meeting. But just to know that these are the two schedules that we're looking at. I can ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. um, again, just from a sort of risk perspective, the average age, what, when do, what is the average retirement age for a town employee? Average what? Retirement age. Yes, it would vary. Depending. Would it vary? There's no, I, that's what I'm saying, I don't know so what, that, instance, what, what um, the reality is, so I guess. What's the average there age? There has been um, pension reform. So after April 12, 2012, um, they increased the age that you could retire. So. Um, with so many years um, service, I want to say 10 years service, and at age 55, anybody could retire prior. After April 2012, pension reform says that you need that 10 years in, and you have to be 60. So, and then to, uh, to get your max age factor prior to pension reform, you would have to be age 65. And then for the people like me who came in after April 2012, 67 to get the, wow. okay. you know, the max. Yeah, um, and you've got to have like 32 years in and have your highest age reached. So it's very hard to get the higher percentages okay. <laughs> unless you get, you've been here your whole career. <laughs> yeah, no, because it looks like the average age of the pensioners is 48. So I was thinking 48 to 55 is a pretty short short run. Oh, where are, we, where are you seeing this? Seeing this on the 
four inch pay gap. That's, that's, that's the average that's age the of the active employees. employees. The average yes. age so of a retired or 70. So right, active, but I'm saying the actives, when they go from active to retired, what age would that be? I would say it'd be over, you know, and closer to that 65. Right, right? so now 65. Unless I was thinking 55, and if it's 55, a hazard, it's A hazardous close. job such as a police officer, firefighter, line worker, it's more like 55 um, because they, 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 their job becomes even more dangerous if they're physically unable to use I gotcha. it. So, so it just depends on who you're talking about. If you're talking about somebody in a dangerous and hazardous job, I would say it'd be closer to that 55, 60. If you're talking about a normal, it'd probably be closer to 60, 65. It's something to watch just because that flips your benefit payments, right? Mm -hmm. Those increase mm -hmm. significantly on you, so then your contribution is a lot less. But every two years, we are looking at it again, and, and they, they, they recognize right. when as you're saying, well, we thought this person would retire at 65, they're out at 62. You know what I mean? So those are the gains, and, you know, or they'd say, well, we expected this person to retire at 65, and here they are at 70 still working. So it's, it's just that those are gains and losses that they kind of factor into the calculation when they're doing it. Right. I guess that's stuff for us to sort of watch as we're looking at this to say what are our pitfalls like greed I mean, yeah. we have to, you know, push on your actuaries about yeah. these things but that's that's not a young population yeah i mean to, that could flip on you so I mean, it's it, just something to think and they about. will point out things to you like you had more deaths than we expected yes you know and that's it yes more all deaths things, of retirees than that if you can predict them i guess is if you're thinking about looking at these things and mm -hmm. push on the actuary you may be able to get some of those looks before they come at you with a report and say oh, you missed yeah that's i guess the thought is because that's your budget at the end of the yeah, day yeah. Yeah. Not very also to it at their time is very expensive actuaries right <laughs> right and that's what i'm saying so some of these things just to look at as you're doing it, to say hey this flips on us these schedules are going to not be what they say they were mm -hmm. for sure yeah. so as we're looking at the money to put into contributions these are the things that we should consider yeah. as we're looking at yeah Speak, to know. speaking of that the, does the retirement board reach out to the uh, community at a certain age when they're coming up qualification of retirement like usually most people retire around like we said roughly you know, generalize it but 60 65 because um, they, they can get their full benefit typically um, does the Reading Retirement Board reach out at a certain age after their employees been employed so long? So when employees starts with a um, municipality and they qualify to be in the retirement system, they sit down with retirement, they're explained, you know, how it all works. And, in the beginning. In the beginning. Um, and then throughout the time that they work um, for the town, at any time they can ask for an estimate um, based on an age that they're hoping to retire. Um, and with some estimates of where their pay might be, just to get an idea. Um, but mostly it focuses on when the employee feels ready. Mm -hmm. They go and they ask for those estimates and see, oh, I can manage that number or I can't. You know, can I live off the number you're telling me or can I not? You know, so throughout the time a person is working for the town, it would be, you know, not unusual to have people contact retirement on a regular basis for estimates. If I were to retire at 65, what would that number look like? If I was to retire at 63, what would that number What's the difference? You know, is it worthwhile to stay those extra couple of years? What, what does it yield to me? Those kind of conversations happen on the regular, and retirement no longer is in this building. They're over on Two Haven, so nobody knows that you've been there. Uh, you know, because sometimes people are worried. Oh, if somebody sees me going in there, that could be problematic. It, it's you know, never would be, but. Some people are afraid to, to reach out to that retirement person. Now that they're in another building, it, it's less of a problem. So. I have a question for clarification. So RMLD uh, also reports on OPED pension and liabilities. Are they included in this? Or do they have their own page? They are included. They yeah, are because included. RMLD is is part well, of. Fun. I think they are not seventy five percent too. I'm gonna go back and look at the numbers oh, okay. again now that I'm seeing these. Yeah, they're not fully funded. Um, they're they're on the same timeline as us. Um, I didn't realize our numbers were that good. Their numbers looked really good, but now now that I'm seeing, I think they're comparable. Where where there's a difference is with OPEP. So OPEP is the other post employment benefits, which is the retirees' health insurance when they retired. That is not mandated by the state for us to fund, but we, several years ago, recognized that we needed to start investing those funds, you know, putting money aside and investing and trying to get something put aside for those, because that's a liability that's ever growing as well. So, but what we're able to put aside is only like 25% of what we really need for the general fund. 
funds. So I think we actually put aside an additional five to six hundred thousand dollars in addition to whatever we pay each month for retiree health insurance and on a pay as you go. But really we have like a two million dollar deficit from what we need to be putting in to get it fully funded in 30 years as, as opposed to what we're able to afford at this point, which is why they look at that funding for the pension and saying, when we're fully funded and there's that drop from 11 to three, that's where a lot of money could come from, if, depending on where the town is at that point. I, maybe not all of it would go there, but a good chunk to get us to that annual required contribution for the general fund, because water, sewer, and stormwater in our Melody, they fully fund their annual required, and will be fully funded for OPEB around the time that we're done with funding the pension. So because theirs are smaller annual required contributions, we're able to get those ones done. The general fund is the bigger fund. That is where, you know, everybody else sits. You know, it's, it, there's smaller groups in water, sewer, stormwater, our is like seven year. You know, there's not a lot of people compared to what the town size is. And so our contribution is just too large right now to fit into our budget, but once this pension assessment is taken care of and we've gotten to a fully funded or mostly fully funded, there could be redirection is what we've always thought. We're also entertaining other ideas because there's this up and down that's constantly happening. The conversation that Bob had, at, had with us was maybe maybe it makes sense to borrow for the remaining um, pension liability and, and smooth it out more. Like let's do some analysis and figure out if that would work. And so there's definitely always thought processes on how to get this done and keep the cash flow more consistent and, and get more done with that money, but you know, it, it's hard to know. It's always been since I've been here, get it fully funded for the pension and then let's redirect some funds. But because we're so close, we're like 10 years away, so. Does, we it, are okay. yeah. Does it make sense to pivot to OPEB or did? Yeah, yeah I was yeah. going to pivot okay. there. Yeah. I know you've got some documents here on that. I'm trying to find where I am on my notes now. Um, yeah, OPEB is on the bottom of the second page. So if you turn to page seven of your six and seven, or seven and eight, so they look like this, these blue sheets. This basically shows you what our um, OPEB liability looks like. The total um, OPEB liability as of June 30th, 2018, was just under, uh, well, just over $68 million, or just shy of $69 million. We have set aside um, just over four million dollars and this does not include RMLD because RMLD just switched to calendar year so there's a separated right now um, they switched to calendar year so we have a separate schedule for them um, the 68 does not include RMLD yeah, and RMLD is I think more funded than we are because there's just a small number um, so 6.18 percent funded at, as of June 30th um, 2018 but if you look at the next page, it actually shows you what the cash flows look like. Now this report is only gonna show you two years because Gatsby 74 and 75 came into play and these numbers were needed for the financial statements. So they were required before um, for the auditors, but they are required now. So they don't have any historical numbers going back further than two years, but it's very telling because it tells you actuarially determined contribution that is needed to fully fund. Mm -hmm. And then you can see how much we actually contributed and you can see there's about a $2 million deficit that we're not able to fund. So that's that's been the problem is that just there isn't enough extra funding laying around that you can throw $2 million at this and, and have both pension and OPEB being fully funded. And so every time we do evaluation for OPEB, it's an open schedule. They know that we aren't fully funding our aim required, and so they do a, a, another 30-year schedule. And then at some point, hoping that we'll be able to make our aim required contributions. And because this isn't mandated, we do what we can, and that's actually viewed very well. Um, we do have more assessed than most. Um, but there are some that do much better than us, so we're somewhere in the middle, but I, I definitely think that there are um, there are other communities that haven't focused on it at all because they're so focused on let me get the pension funded and we'll worry about that later. Meanwhile, this never continues to grow. And everyone in pension is also in OPEP. Yes, one thing I failed to mention is that our retirement system does not include your teachers. Um, the teachers are part of the Mass Teachers Retirement System, so they're actually considered kind of state employees, but they are our employees when it comes to their benefits. <laughs> so later, it's confusing. you know, so that can be oh, confusing. Oh, so it's a, it's a larger, okay, so it's, so it's a larger population. Yeah, because the that's what I was, I, I was surprised. Employee, they work yeah. for us, 
but they get a different benefit through the state being a teacher. So anybody who is a teacher who has a teacher's license that works with the school district is going to be covered under mass teachers, and that's where their deductions go to mass, mass teachers. It changes. But when the time comes that they retire, they retired from Reading, they're getting uh, benefits from Reading. And changes in the assumptions are part of the negotiations then. <coughs> Negotiations level, in the with contract? the unions, yeah. Like, how do they? How does that flow through? The assumptions um, to the, the retirement. Actuary. Yeah. Does that does that happen? I think that she makes estimates based on what we've seen. Okay. And you know, so it's based on that. And sometimes the estimates are very um, conservative. Sometimes they're more aggressive. Yeah. It just depends on what the line item is. And you can see if you looked at the um, last page. Yeah, I saw she'll that. She'll talk about kind of some of the things they're looking at. Payroll growth at two and a half percent, you know, salary increases, you know, so they basically say she had gone from a six percent down to four point two five percent because we don't actually give six percent increases on the town. That's just not realistic. But that's the kind of things that actuaries would go. They would say, Oh, five, six percent are the increases. Not so here at the town level. They were getting a five or six percent increase. So they bring these um, percentages down as they realize that they're unrealistic. Um, and then, healthcare. <laughs> yeah, and the discount rate at seven and a half. That's the other thing I failed to mention, but OPEB, um, there's legislation that was enacted years ago um, so that we could we could invest <coughs> these monies with PRIT as well so that we could get better returns and get close to being funded. And when I started, we had started talking um, to the state retirement board trying to figure out how that process worked. But at the time, the legislation wasn't very clear about what needed to be set up. We had accepted Chapter 32, Section 20 um, at town meeting and set up a trust. But the way Pert wanted to see it, they wanted an actual trust document, which meant you had to have a trustee or a board of trustees. How does that happen? You know, And it wasn't very clear all the steps that needed to be taken. So it took several years for legislation to actually get passed, and we, we accepted I think in 2017, that section of the law again, so that our trust would fall under the new changes that they had made. And now we have, um, in draft form, a trust document that um, Ramirez has put together for us, and I will be presenting that to the select board. Once they approve that, we can apply to invest these funds with OPEB and get better returns than what we've been getting. Um, because we really have very little compared to what the actual liability is. When you've got four million dollars and the liability is sixty-eight million, kind of a kind of a big gap that we have in getting better returns is something that we need to be doing. So that's coming down the pipeline. You might hear that coming up because it's going to be something that's presented to select board and um, and hopefully they meet twice a year. That um, state retirement benefits trust they actually meet twice a year. So depending on the time, you know, that if we can get the sooner we can get in, the better. Um, and then we would hopefully get better returns and maybe so make a little bit more headway. Potentially close to getting this in print. Yeah, but it took a long time for that legislation to clarify all of the things that were gray in the beginning. Well, how's this supposed to work? How's the, who's supposed to be the trustees? Who are, you know, there was so much that was questionable. And Pritt really didn't even want to accept anybody, or they didn't really even want to accept our application without an actual trust document. We didn't really know how well, who's supposed to be the trustee, who's the trust, board of trustees, how's that work? Um, so it was one of those, and everybody found themselves in that same spot. This this legislation doesn't give us enough information to tell us what to do. So that is coming down the pipeline, and the money will be invested with Pritt, hopefully in the near future, so we get better returns. Yeah, on the school side, are there pensions? They're through the state, so I would guess. Not. <laughs> yeah, the, well, most of the people who work for this the school are largely teachers with teaching licenses, and they would be mass teachers. Um, so they're almost like state employees, the mass teachers retirement system. But they're cafeteria workers or paras, people who maybe aren't teachers, would be in our retirement system if they work enough hours. The other thing in our retirement system, which is typical of all retirement systems, is you actually have to work 1,690 hours a year to get into our system. A lot of other retirement systems, you work 20 hours, you're in. We're not that way. So our liability, you know, might be small because of that, because we actually 
don't get part-time people in there because they tend to move around and they don't end up retiring. You're just moving their funds from one retirement system to another. It's just a lot more administrative. It's more administrative cost than we need. They don't end up staying with you long-term and actually retiring when, they're, when they start for part-time. So um, that's another thing to know. So that being said, we'll move on to free cash. Unless you guys want to hear more. Questions. Good. So, so thanks for answering the question. This is really helpful. So, any, any other questions on? It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry if I miss anything. But no, no, no. I think that's that was the great. intent that's of me great. writing this up so that you guys can yeah. read it. If I miss yeah. anything, at least you'll know what I intended to tell you. Right. Um, any other questions on pension OPEP right now before we move to um, cash? Just a thought that, you know, it's sort of startling to me look at the, the numbers on the forecasts here um, you know we're going from roughly six percent of our budget to probably somewhere on the order of ten percent of our budget by 2029 you're looking at going to fund pension. pensions I'm looking at these yeah. the, the two forecasts Schedule. here right yep. so mm -hmm. um, I guess it had never occurred to me I mean that that, that to me is more significant than five percent annually that if it's consuming that much of our budget what is it going to squeeze out what is it going to mean mm -hmm. for for us otherwise um, and I totally understand the desire to get to you know to be funded by 2029 and start working on OPEP and those sorts of things but um, you know 2029 is not that far away um, and, and you know 10% of our budget going to pension funding is going to be pretty this, this pretty um, potential squeeze. like I said we've been increasing the pension um, the, the, the assessment amount by four and a half yep. percent for as long as I've been Increasing it every year by four and a half to five percent is not uncommon for us. Um, yeah, I guess I just you know, but the, what that means is that in the last ten years it went from say four percent to six percent of our budget, and in the next ten years it's going to go from six to ten percent of our mm -hmm. budget. That's you know yeah. even bigger. So the, the challenge the here is the yeah. compounding of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah but the, the, the challenge the, here is that you cannot long ever long 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 contribute long less long than you did the prior year. So. Uh, understood. Six million. Yep. And so, and, and also, I feel like the. Is that only on a percentage basis, or is that on a dollar, 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 dollar basis? basis? So every year it so has good, to be. So you fair. could conceivably yeah, right. yeah. have a sliding scale percentage wise <coughs> as long as you were hitting it on a dollar side. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's noteworthy to be mentioned is that these funding schedules are approved by the retirement board. Yeah. They have Kind of forced down the town's throat. <laughs> not, not, you know what I mean? But not. Well, it's we supposed try to be voted by, by town meeting, though, right? I mean, it's a um, budget line item. That gets it's a bit, uh, the benefits line item for yeah. assessments is there. Yeah. Um, but it's approved by the retirement board, yeah. and we usually work hand in hand with Bob to see what's affordable. Nobody wants to make anything uncomfortable. Um, but this is the way it's been going, so I don't know of any other way. I mean, I do feel like um, none of the funding schedules I've ever seen in yeah. the past have ever allowed us to let go of 1% or 2%. It just seems like it would push us so far out and it's amazing how, how far out it would be to not let this go up by 4% or... Yeah, so to, so to be clear, I'm not at all questioning whether or not it's the right answer, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if we want to get to 2029, it's the right answer. That's what the math tells us. Yeah. Um, all I'm suggesting is, you know, we look at capital from a very long-term perspective, right? I mean, there are you know, these things that are major drivers of the budget we try and get out in front of with the community and and you know this is the first time I'm I'm personally sort of like having an awareness of how significant this is going to become as a percentage of our budget and you know people are going to start wondering what that means in terms of living and over and this again. is what it but, looks you know, like right now in yeah. two years I don't know what this guy sure. looks like For sure. <laughs> you know what I mean I did. And that's a, but that's part of the point of managing risk yeah, is not it's five. not about you know the returns like look at the risk and keep the risk level because that's the only way you move you flip this on its head is by having the, the assets and liabilities ride together and if you don't right and they're just hedged essentially and then anything you're putting in is upside yeah. and that's that's the ultimate game but you need you need you need the town would need consulting work yeah to do that so there may be a cost to do that. But I wonder if the savings would outweigh the cost for the town. It's something to consider. Yeah, it's definitely something to consider. I mean, there's a lot of options on how you do this, honestly. But it seems like the general consensus that we've had thus far was get this funded as quickly as possible because this OPEP one is, is growing and we're not able to fund it. 
Do you know what I mean? I do, yeah. I just don't, yeah, you just wonder. It's just like it's the balancing act that we can't, we can't fund both of them and, and how do we get to it quicker? Yeah. And because who knows how far down the line it is the state starts to mandate that will need to start to be funded and be funded by a certain date. How, how far away is that mandate? Because it's got to be coming. Because there's definitely communities who... <laughs> but that doesn't change your answer on what you have to fund, it would just mean no, the timetable or I think how quickly you get to fund No, but that's why I think that's why we're so like, I, we don't want to kick the can for pension further down the road because we know that we have another big liability. And right, by the way, all these liabilities now appear on the face of the balance sheet, so it looks like a big old mess. I mean, so you, it, you can't forget they're there. They just present themselves in, 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 on that front of the face of the balance sheet and it, it looks horrible. Um, we do need to address them. They're, they've been kind of unaddressed for too long. So it's hard. There's no but it sounds like that's already, but that's something that's been started. Uh, like you, to, your, to your point, that that sounds like that's happening. You yeah. guys are looking at the at things a little differently and trying to pull away from the. And we're trying one. to think of outside the box and yeah. some other ways we could do this. So I mean, Bob has sat with NG and I and tried to, you know, hash out some other ideas. Maybe there's a, a different approach we take and we can get this done in a different way. Well, that, that, that's kind of, <clears throat> I think that's kind of what Sean's kind of getting at is we see this, you know, each year as the compounded interest gets uh, higher and higher, you know, you're going to add 50000 Then the following year, you're adding 30000 then 35, 37, 40, because it's compounded onto the previous number. Your 5% should, in theory, should go 5%, 4.5%, you know, if you want to keep the same monetary value like uh, increase your wages a true dollar amount mm -hmm. but decrease your percentage right so if you go five percent you're at 315 from 20 uh 21 to 22 315,000 then 22 to 23 you're 340,000 mm -hmm. so that just continually increases and you end up at nine ten percent of your annual budget so i guess the question is what's the bigger picture plan right is what is the town going to do maybe it's the permanent building committee what's the town to do to, in order to pro, uh, provide additional revenue to the town to help curb the cost or are we just going to use the free cash based upon the estimated growth of that was another um topic to be discussed with you know where there is savings within the health insurance a lot of a lot of this increase is going to come from there um, but there, there may be a case for using some one-time free cash here to help buffer that increase um, because we are building free cash at such a good pace um, so that's another conversation for finance forum is what are we willing to use for free cash because a lot of times we've been advised one-time items are a better use of free cash right. yep. and so maybe money being directed towards this um, helps this liability get more in line with that five percent that we've been seeing and, um, you know but I see what you're saying it is it's a huge number but also our salaries is the biggest expense we have um, and so this is part of that part of their whole package their salary and their benefits so salaries and benefits are our biggest numbers so we can't get around that so as we pivot to free cash you'll kind of go over where we are right now mm -hmm. and some historical perspective on that and then um, we one of the committee members has as a proposal to discuss around some potential you know uh, how, how to look at the free cash especially given its balance right now mm -hmm. and some some uh, an idea for conversation so we'll build on the, the function that you lay so so I'm sure you're familiar <coughs> those have been on the board have seen this chart before this is just a chart that shows us the 10 years of free cash that have been certified and then I then I project out the next three years. So for fiscal 19, the year is is, is done, but we're not closed fully. Um, there's a lot of moving parts at the end of the year, so I cannot give you an accurate figure of what, what regeneration looks like for 19. I'm going to give you an approximation based on a five-year average of what regeneration looks like. And But you can see that we're making steady strides in growing our free cash. I'm sorry, Sharon, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just from a, and you might, I might ask Paula or somebody else who's been on the committee a while to help me, but from a policy perspective, we are, what do we say? We, 7%. We were targeting 7%, right? But um, if it, that's our target, 7% yeah, of free uh, cash revenues. Plus stabilization funds yeah. plus reserves in general. Not necessarily just That's 7%. Reserve. And then if it goes below a certain threshold, I think it's 5, then it's that, that triggers a 
Yeah. It triggers a response yeah. from us. Yeah. What do we to, do next? Exactly. And that's a relatively new policy. Let's yeah, last couple of years. Yeah. I'd say within yeah. the last three yeah. years, maybe four. Yeah, and that seven represented an increase from mm -hmm. our policy of five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're targeting seven yeah. percent. And I feel like higher levels of reserves is viewed very positively by bond yep. um, rating agencies and we borrow at very low percentage rates because we are a AAA rated town. So that's important to note as well. So if you look at the next pages, this is the free cash calculation for the last 10 years and the projections out. So what you'll notice is um, that we start with what was the free cash starting up the year that was certified and then we will plug in the number of regeneration or that favorable variance. There's two ways that we regenerate free cash. So let me start by saying municipalities, um, we adopt a budget that is a balanced budget. So that means that we project a certain amount of revenues and our budget expenses match them. So revenues equal expenditures, that's the way the budget is built. And so the way that we regenerate free cash is that we collect more revenues than we projected. And then the, so that's one way. And then the second way is to spend less in expenses than we budgeted. The combination is your, your favorable variance. And that's what you see in bold um, if you're looking at pages 10 and 11, um, is each year what that favorable variance was. Um, and then we net out any uses of free cash that we approved at town meeting since it had been certified. And and that's how we get down to the number um, that you see each year. And then that, that number is brought to the top the next year. And then the whole process starts again. So if you were looking at um, fiscal 19, you could see that we started off um, fiscal 19 with certified free cash of just over $11 million. I'm, I'm projecting a favorable variance um, on a five-year average. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at you know under $4 million. Would be more. Would be a little bit less. Um, so that's based on an average. I am seeing numbers that would support a number like this um, based on what I'm seeing thus far. The reason I can't ever give you a, a number like that at this point, and I'd never be able to give you a number until at least September 30th, is the way this works is any fund that ends in a deficit, um, I have to deduct it from free cash. But the caveat is, is if I collect that money by September 30th, I don't have to deduct it. So I don't, and that can swing a lot depending on what it is. Grants are the big um, area here because grants are reimbursement in nature, spend the money, and then we submit for reimbursement. So it's not uncommon for a grant to be negative at year end because they require us to spend the money first and then they reimburse us. So grants can be very large and they can add up. So if I quote you something and then we have to deduct a ton of um, deficit because the way that DOR views this is this money that's in deficit that we didn't get from the state in time, you borrowed it from the general fund, so it deducts it. Um, and so that's, so I, I can see where things look right now, but things are still moving upstairs because we are still paying bills that are fiscal 19. But I can see the revenues very clearly. So I feel like this number that I'm showing you, I think we definitely have at least that. So, um, but so I wanted to give you some idea of where those numbers might be. Um, and I do think this is a fair estimate. Um, and so if this is the number, which is, is not an accurate number, it's a five-year average of our regeneration over the last several years, we'd be somewhere in that $13.844 million range. And then the estimates that I'm doing for fiscal 20 and fiscal 21 are very conservative. 1.5 is a very low number for us, but it's just so hard to know. Um, and so we always just kind of plug those in, and then we usually use about $1 million each year to support the operating budget, so I plug those numbers in. Sometimes we use more, sometimes we use less, but I haven't gotten a sense from the board, from the um, income, whether or not you want that increased or if you're going to stay at that $1 million, so I'd leave it at $1 million. So looking at that, if everything were to come to fruition the way I've put it out there by 2021, we'd have almost $15 million. I think that's a low side number, <laughs> given the way things run for us. Other than that, I don't think I have much to share regarding free cash other than those are my estimates. Oh, thank you. Any, any questions on this from anybody? I guess one comment. So the only, we missed comments. twice in eight years, not regenerated. What we had, like the balance went down twice in 10, right? Let's see. That's what it looked like. So pretty good track record of increase. Pretty good track record, yeah. I mean, it, normally it does go up. 
It went down here. 2010 2011. Yeah. Looks like it went down. Three times, actually, you're right. 2017. 17, that was the third one. You got two, Eric. I missed one on the first page. In 2010. Yeah, so three, okay. So maybe it's less than a... So, and it, it tends to work out. We use a million dollars of free cash to support the budget. We usually regenerate more than that. So it, it's almost <coughs> as if we didn't use free cash. Because Did we use 2.2 just before my time, in 2016? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. Basically, the stave off cuts at the override then into. Actually, it wasn't before. Yeah, the, when the override failed. We already started a million. Yeah, yeah. That was like a well, in 17, it went down. Did we spend that, if you look at that spring town meeting? Mm -hmm. Was that a, a special town meeting? Mm -hmm. That was a very conscious decision, wasn't that? Which, right. which year was that? 17. That had to do yeah. with the, uh, the high school. The high school yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That so we used some free cash to have a conscious decision. And it was a one-time one use. Based on it wasn't building up our budget. Yeah. Okay. So I, that one's tough. Okay. That, right. Yeah, because that's a lot of use that year. And it's a conscious yeah. decision. <laughs> What's that? That one doesn't count. No, I'm just kidding. You're right. That, is, that was extraordinary. I, that's why it's there. That's right. extraordinary. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't happen that often. But we went in eyes wide open. Yeah. We for sure. Any other questions, comments? So Sharon, just rough order of magnitude, um, what are the, what's the value of the other reserves, the county that reserves total? The um, stabilization fund is about $1.6 million. Yeah. There had been some talk at, at prior FinCon meetings of moving that 7% of our reserves to a stabilization fund, but just be knowing that a stabilization fund requires a two-thirds vote to get it out. So if you ever need that money, you can need a two-thirds vote at town meeting. That's the only real difference. Could you um, provide some context historically about what the stabilization fund of 1-6? Yeah. Since I've been here, we have never used it for anything. So what, from what I understand, that money that went in um, when we did the last override to provide some... The last, last one, wait. The last, the last one before, yeah. the one yeah. we just did. Yeah. So what, 14 or 15 yeah. years ago, whatever. And it has not been touched. Because our free cash yeah. got down to, but the previous override, it was... Great. It was... Like they, had, they had nothing yeah. left, yeah. And so they needed something sitting there that was a, a right safety right. buffer, and it's never been touched since. And so that's the other reserve that's primarily used. And then we always kind of add in our FinCom reserves, because those are kind of just... You know, used if we yep. have unexpected, but a lot of times they're turned back. And that's two hundred thousand. Yeah. No. And free cash does not reflect those two numbers. The stabilization mm -hmm. fund and the two hundred. They're not in right. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I emailed Eric just asked to kind of talk through something that I've been thinking about. Um, uh, you know, when you look at when you look at our free cash position, our reserves position in total, bring in the numbers that Sharon just shared. By the end of the year, by the time we settle fiscal year 19, we might be looking at a number of close to 16 million dollars somewhere in that ballpark. Um, it's well over double what our policy calls for, <clears throat> and nobody can say for sure. But you know, I've asked Bob in the past, like you know, if we were at 13 million instead of 14 million what does that do to our you know what we pay for for borrowing and um you can't say for sure right because it's they don't really they, openly tell you they don't tell you they just they bid based on looking at your financials and whatnot um but I, i've never gotten the sense that we think it would like crater our borrowing rates or anything like that if we were say a million dollars lower in free cash um i hear from residents a lot that they think our free cash position is pretty high um and i'm kind of inclined to agree as a, as a general rule um and in particular when i think about the, the you know uh, the regeneration over the last couple of years um, some of it is things like excise taxes have been higher than we've seen historically so we project kind of historical number and if it comes in higher than that we see regeneration as a result of that um, but some of it particularly in this past year is going to be unspent override funds right um, we, we asked for an override to fund a bunch of positions there's a natural lag in hiring and staffing and then ultimately paying those positions um, on some level I would argue that the money that we raised in taxes this year um, um, that went to regen, which ostensibly was to pay for positions that we weren't able to fill this year, sort of isn't the towns to spend, right, on, on some philosophical level. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, if you believe that, you know, what would you do with that? A few things you can do. Um, we could say, you know, let's spend $2 million of free cash in the budget for 20, um, and, or for 21, I guess. Um, we could say <coughs> spend $2 million of free cash in the budget for 21, and then the select board can choose to say to set a lower tax levy, for instance. And people would get it back in a reduced tax rate. Um, you could theoretically, I don't, I don't know if it's legal, but you could theoretically could do some sort of 
cash rebate to, to you know to taxpayers in town. I think that's administratively a nightmare trying to figure out who and how much and all that sort of stuff. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm seeing. I'm getting like I'm getting side eye from this I'm side of the table. Yeah. So I'm just I'm, I'm saying like what's a range of possibilities. So uh, so I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that one. Um, the, just for the record, um, the, the, the tax rate I think is, is interesting, right? Um, and my understanding, and Sharon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the levy limit isn't impacted if we choose to set the levy lower than the limit in one year. So mm -hmm. we still could go, you know, if you go two and a half percent annually, we could choose to only go up, say, one and a half percent one year, mm -hmm. and then recover that one the following year by actually increasing by more than two and a half percent. Yeah. So it doesn't have a compounded long-term impact on our ability to, to raise tax revenue. Um, so it's kind of interesting from that perspective. Um, the, flip, the flip side of that is I just think about how um, this town reacts to things we do from a tax perspective and the, that hit of trying to explain why in year two you're doing three and a half percent or four percent when two and a half percent is all we're legally allowed to do isn't just not worth it it's um, complex right yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's not worth it so so uh so throw out both of my first two ideas right um i've been thinking about it. it's a long summer we don't have a lot of meetings um so so then uh, i was thinking about this other conversation that we've been having which is you know the the nature of the way we build budgets is that we uh, have to choose sort of the things we need to fund in the short term, and potentially put you know push aside things that might have a longer term kind of ROI that you think about as an investment in a business context. Um, and so I started thinking about well, what if we were to take a chunk of free cash and create you know call you know call it a fiscal sustainability fund or something like that, um, create a pool of money that was explicitly dedicated to help us identify and fund operating expenses that we would do as investment investments in a town's sort of future sustainability, right? Um, and so, so for those of you who are uh, have been on the committee before, last year when we were doing the budget review with the schools, um, I asked the superintendent about this. I said, what are the things that we're not funding today that if you were to try and sort of you know build a business case around it, you, you could make an argument that in the medium to long term, this would be valuable spend, but we just don't have room for it in the budget today. And, Frankly, it was pulling teeth to get to an answer there because politically there's no sort of incentive for him to sort of talk about those things. Um, and, and I would say that probably the same is true of Bob. We, I didn't ask the question of Bob, but um, there's no incentive to talk about the things you're not doing, right? Um, but what I want to sort of think about is whether it makes sense for us to create both an incentive and a process to talk about the things that we're choosing not to do that we might do if we looked at them from a medium to long-term sustainability perspective. Um, and the, and the, you know, just one idea that I had for kind of how it would, 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 could work would be something like, let's take a million bucks of free cash, put it in a fund. Um, I don't know whether it's the committee that votes at our town meeting or exactly what that looks like. We'd have to sort of explore the possibility. I think it has to go to town meeting. Do you have anything meeting. from free cash? Well, to create the fund. You right have saying? to create the fund, but also anything that comes out of free fund. cash has to come through town meeting. Well, like, we can spend reserves, though. The thing on reserves, you guys have the authority. Anything that's coming out of free cash yeah, is a town meeting vote. So yeah, no, so, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is, I, want, I don't know if it's possible. Maybe, yeah. there's, maybe there's a vehicle where you say, you know, town meeting approves creating a FinCom approved vehicle, right? Yeah. Like FinCom reserves, yeah. right? So, or maybe town meeting votes it. I don't really have a dog in the yeah. fight. I'm just throwing out the possibilities. Um, but you create a fund where the explicit objective of that fund is to identify things that are not in the budget that you can sort of write a business case for and say, we think this has a medium to long term sustainability benefit for the town's economics. Um, and, the, you know, you put guidelines around it, like things like, um, you know, uh, there's sort of a soft commitment that we expect to fund the thing for a minimum of three years, for instance, right? We're not going to pull the rug out after year one before you get a chance to see any return, for instance. Um, that you reevaluate sort of whether or not the fund should be re-upped, you know, on a periodic basis, right? And think about things like that. Um, but the notion would be to create sort of, again, an incentive as well as a process. Like a think tank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it, you know, it creates, you know, an incentive for for Bob and for Dr. Doherty to put real time into thinking about and to sort of open up the curtain Are a little bit. Thinking, thinking of about one time items or, or something like you know that would be built into the budget long term. I guess that's what I was saying. So so uh, I I would my suggestion would be because I think it's relatively easy for us to fund one time items if there's yeah. a clear case for it. I think it's difficult for us to fund 
operating expenses that recur, right? So, so the thinking would be that the, the, the bias would be towards things that would look like operating expenses versus one-time mm -hmm. one -time costs. But they're operating expenses that over time will generate That's savings right. where they're, they're initially funded by your That's proposed right. fund, but then they can become kind of self-sustaining yes. because it offsets so, elsewhere. So, so, yeah. so Mark says yeah. like what? I'm so, kind of thinking about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so I'll give you an example. Yeah. Yeah. So when we talked to, we talked to Dr. Doherty, I think there were ultimately like two examples that he really honed yep. in on. Um, one is full day kindergarten, which is probably beyond the sort of dollar scope of what we'd be talking about in terms of something right. we pull out of free cash. But the, the other one was... Sorry, why would even full day kindergarten? Because it would be a... Why would it be that way? Because the notion is that for the kids that don't go to full day kindergarten, they're getting poorer outcomes along the way. Um, and, our, and some of our spending in their, you know, middle school, high school years may be less um, if every kid okay, in town wants to spend That's the business model. That's the business, I mean, that's yeah, the business okay, case. Yeah, 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 you don't, whether you agree with it or not, just an example of something where you, you, you'd say there's a benefit that you don't see for some number yes. of years after you spend yes. the money. Well, you're talking um, about an individual benefit, too. So me as an individual, I pay $5,500 a year for my go-to full-day kindergarten. Right, but that's not from the town. No, no, I, I get that. I get it, yeah, with two more coming through, I agree with him. But okay. uh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. But it's a sunk cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. um, no, but so, uh, but but another example was um, additional. I think of like additional counseling support, right? Yeah. Um, and and that would be re relatively inexpensive. Maybe it's a couple, you know, a couple of TEs. Um, and again, the notion is that those kids are having better outcomes and requiring fewer supports five years, ten years from now when they're still in our school system. Uh, and and. Cost for us. Ultimately, so, would decrease special ed costs. That's right, right, yeah, down the road. yeah, and and uh, you know what you're not ever going to get, what you're not ever going to get is you know Dr. Doherty putting together a model that says if we hire two new psychologists, yeah. we're going to have 17 less kids in right. uh, you know in, in, in enrolled in special ed programs in 2024. Like that's not going to happen, right. right? Right. The challenge is getting good data. Let's yeah. Say, yeah. 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 You know, let's say you do make that investment. <clears throat> That's really hard to get the data so, to so support that it paid for itself. I would suggest that part of the process would be you've got to sort of define what are you going to measure that gives yeah. us some benchmark of whether or not this is succeeding, right? Um, and it, and it, it may not always be as clean and as happy for us as, as 17 fewer kids you know, versus some cohort from five years ago are, are enrolled in special ed, but there might be other things you can think about that are at least you know, um, illustrative as benchmarks, if not sort of directly descriptive. I think it's very interesting. I, I think the data would be just so hard because there's so many other factors. Because that's not what I could come up with. Just even special ed in general, you know, you do. I, I always feel strongly that as we lead up to an override, we stress out the regular day funding so much that the net result is we get more kids in special ed. I feel like I've seen it for two cycles. So no surprise, yeah. But that's a, that, that's the area I feel like that's yeah. And, and I mean, it's it's kind of the only area we've talked about because we haven't really sort of pushed people to think about this up to this point. Um, but my hypothesis would be that if we again sort of created this incentive where there's kind of a pool of money that could potentially fund something you wouldn't otherwise find room for in your budget, that that, that would kind of get people to sort of think more about Spur some about creative thinking what, on you know, what, what those items might be. On the town side as well. On the town side as well. So, yeah. do, you need to, do, so do you need to set that up in order to set, like, you know, instead of chicken and egg, can, can't you have that discussion without the fund? Uh, we can, um, but so what I worry about. promise of a fund? You know, like, you know, down yeah. there, I mean, so I mean, yeah. I mean, I, it's, I, I mean, I think I think that's in practice what would be happening, right? Because if the fund were to, were to happen, it can't happen until November, and we're going to start talking about budgets in October. So in practice, like that's what would literally have to happen. Are you thinking taking, let's say, a million dollars out of free cash, putting this fiscal sustainability um, fund, sure. let's say, yeah. would you be putting a million dollars each year in there from free cash? I, I, so not to start, I wouldn't think. I mean, I think it would be something like, you know, let's make sure that this thing has, say, five years of viability. Mm -hmm. And so you limit what you're willing to spend to, say, 200K. Mm -hmm. And as 
as we see results, right, from some of these things, again, you know, whatever benchmarks we define, yeah. as we see results, then we can, you know, choose to just sort of re-up the fund so we can continue funding things after that five-year period. We can increase the size of the fund if we think it's a good model and, and there's more things that we could be investing in, right? You know, and there's... You would can, this be something that would be evaluated by FinCom in terms of, okay, right. we gave you X dollars, you show me the data that shows me that this actually worked out. How, is that how you envision yes. it? Yeah. Yeah. But we're not, I mean, we're, I'm playing devil's advocate for a second. I'm not an elected official. Right. I'm not, yeah. right? I, I, I mean, I like to think my opinion counts somewhere, but... I'm not elected to show giving me money to spend, I don't think is the right thing to do. I see your point. Again, I don't it's know if it's like, like, whether we spend or town meeting spends it. Yeah, yeah. I just I, I view it as point, a I, guess. I view it as a FinCon led exercise because it's gotta be across both town and schools. I know. Um, and because it's it's it is about it is about sort of you know, creating that accountability for are you succeeding against whatever benchmarks we define, right? Yeah. And then reporting that, let's say it's to town, if it's town meeting voting and the actual expenditures, you're reporting that to town meeting. I think something like that makes a lot of sense, yeah. like to your point. And I think there needs to be that extra check just because yeah. we're, we're not. You know what I mean? I love the, the fact that we could sort of do that, that type of work. I love the idea. I really do love the idea. I just, I think that extra check at the end would be yeah. a suggestion, at least just to make sure that yeah. the voters have the final say. At the end of the day, it's their money, it's their gig. We can come up with good yeah. ideas, and that's part of why we're right here. You know, we're all volunteering our time to do that, but they still have that. So I'll play devil's advocate to your devil's advocate, sure. right? Um, which is, uh, you know, if we're if this is biased towards things that are recurring expenses, there's a real risk that it falls off the next year because we've got some temporary budget crunch, right? Yeah. Um, and that I think that risk is exacerbated if it's a town meeting decision versus a FinCon decision, potentially. Sure. Um, so that that would be the case for not having it go to town meeting year after year after year. Uh, for approval, you go to town meeting on a regular basis to refund the fund, right? right? And so well, that yeah, would be the, that would be the accountability to the town. Well, to the that, yeah, I think that's almost how you set it up. If you set it up as this ter term, yeah, you know that it's it's for this three year term, yeah. And so that's not you know, you're not making it you know an appointment, right? You know every time it's right. okay. Well, then if it's that cycle, and then hopefully by that time we have some data that starts right. to you know. You know, kind of, then you start to look at the next one, right? And it does put burden on this, on us to then go report out on that in a certain way to the voters. Like, if there's administrative aspect to this for everybody too, at some level. So, out of curiosity, it seems like a lot of the, a lot of this is, for some of the examples you said, educational speaking, the things that um, we could do to reduce costs in long term and grow the town essentially, right? And bring other people in. Uh, to want to be part of the town. The question is, uh, what other, do you know any other prime examples that wouldn't fit under RMLD specific, permanent building specific? So, I, I mean, there, there have been points in time when we didn't have budget for like an economic development coordinator, for instance, right? Like okay. that would have been something you might have said, yeah. you know, that's not a this year priority, but if we believe that an economic development commit coordinator means that our tax revenue in 10 years pays for that salary today, Absolutely. that'd be something you might fund out of this, right? Just as an example, I mean, we, have, yep. we haven't funded now because of the override, but it's, an, it's a town site example that could have been that position is funded from the permits for Bobby, or is it? I thought well, that, I don't remember. I know that that's the way it's been you funded. The, there's like a permits revolving fund in that economic directive. Yeah, that was a relatively new source director. That Yeah, was I, I don't know. In fiscal 20, if that's the way it was funded, but that's the way it's been funded is coming out of this permits revolving fund. They knew they had these funds available and that they there would be in enough. That yeah, case. there'd be enough to, to get that position yeah. for so many years and hopefully be able to generate revenue right. that would actually help. That's us the principle Sean is talking about. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I mean, so same so idea, but coming from a different It's the same place. idea with a very <laughs> narrow use, right? A very narrow use case. So, so take that idea and broaden it out so that we can be more creative about what else there might be. Right. You know, and I can imagine things like, you know, open it up to town employees, make a content out of it, right? Like, yeah. it doesn't have to be you and Bob coming up with these ideas either. Well, there's other grants that you can qualify for if you put up the money to build yeah. certain things. Then you can get state grants, not just for regular town grants, but um, Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, everything, especially uh, health-related and uh, fitness-related and yeah. community-related, cool. going green. 
one of the things I think of is that we don't have anybody who writes grants and who's looking for That's grants for us. Right. And at least in the town side, anyway, it's, it's usually the department doing that. We don't have somebody whose primary focus is to look for grants that bring something That's meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. That would be a perfect example of grant and writer. You could probably yourself. share that with another town. Yeah. 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 And we yeah. do regionalize and do things like that. Yeah. We can go across with something, yeah. have something in the town and share it with another town. So we have a regional housing coordinator. So, you know, we have a regional assessor. We save on a lot of cost and we, we get a lot of benefit for that. Um, but I always wonder about the grant writer because it's a lot of work to get some of these grants. The proposals are oh, yeah. really very extensive. And it's just something. I, and I don't even know what's out there that we're missing, you know, but yeah. most departments do that themselves. It's, it's the time uh, grant, grant writers, grant writers are prize they worth every penny. <laughs> they usually end up paying for themselves with the grants that they end up getting. Typically. That's what you would think. Yeah. 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 That's the only thing that's coming to yeah. mind as yeah, you yeah. say that. But yeah. not bad for five minutes. You're thinking about it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, now we're all thinking about <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly. you know, something else. No, and I, it does create a great culture yep. to tell yep. staff to have this available. Get creative. Yeah. So it's a it's a really positive. Well, I think thing. the messaging is always going to be key, and yeah, especially on the bodies that we're going to have to talk to about it. The, that that is just as important as the structure of it is how you message it. Yeah. And you know the positives of you know mm -hmm. just you were talking about the grant piece of it. You have, you're going to have to spell out and sell it. You know that this is what it's going to be able to do, and it kind of reinforces the whole premise of it. Yeah. But you put all these people with all different backgrounds together, you can get a lot of creative ideas. Mm -hmm. so it's a nice way to get some of those ideas flowing. And I think that and that reinforces the you know we need this set up in order to do all of that. Yep. You know that you know, that that you know uh, reinforces the actual structure. Yep. And I so think we become the grant people, <laughs> right? In a way. Oh, we're yeah, right, we're, writing, right. we're writing grants to the town from the town's money, yes. Yeah. I think the bigger it gets, like when you start, some, I, I feel like it would be almost impossible to really ever measure. Like the bigger ones, like getting yeah. three more psychologists and blah, blah, blah. Cause, yeah. But there's some really interesting ideas people come up, come up with with relatively short money. Just the, yeah. Just the employee that alone of increasing yeah. people's engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, so something like that psychologist one, right? I mean, just to come, come back to this point of sort of like proxies or benchmarks, um, it might not be I can draw a straight line from a dollar I spent to a dollar I saved, but it might be I, I don't know what they measure in the schools, but you know. Behavioral therapist intervention declined 10% year over year, right? Or you know, this cohort of students versus the, the this cohort a year ahead of them were 5% less likely to, you know, whatever. I don't know. It's not something that they actually do measure, right? And and you you'd have to believe, you'd have to make a case that that has some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of financial benefit tied to it in, in the end, right? Um, and what's the tail on that? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, like yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I'm going. So, so how do you yeah, figure this I'm out? Not, I, I don't. I don't disagree that some of those particular examples might be difficult to sort of build a case for. Um, they were just the ones that we happen to have presented to us so far. Right, and firmly believe that. Well, and it might just require some creativity on the measurement side too, or or maybe there are things that we don't measure now because it costs a lot to measure them that we could measure as a part of this. I, mean, I, I don't know. I, it goes along the line of calculated risk. We're doing the same thing with the pension fund. You know, there's some type of calculated risk you have to take based upon whatever you're proposing. Uh, you're going to propose that you're going to have a 5% increase year after year. They take calculated risk based upon studies to local communities that have the same increase uh, from what their prior is. You have to take the same assumption and say, hey, based upon this, we hope we trend the same way. And it might not have a dollar sign, but you record it and you project that every year as part of income. Well, you start with the ideas and then you build the plans out. You know, I mean, like, the ideas are one thing, and then you have to have some some plan behind it. And then that's, yeah. you know, and you're not going to you're not gonna say yes to everything. So yeah. right. um, you, you, you weigh the ones that, you know, that make sense, especially if you're going to do something straight out of the gate. Right. Who is the board that's reviewing it? Or we think that come reviewing the grants or the requests? <laughs> I mean, I think that's TBD, yeah. right? And, you yeah. know, I mean, I, I, my suggestion would be FinCom at least plays a role in making a recommendation to town meeting at a minimum. Yeah. Whether or not we structure it as a FinCom reserve that we can spend 
is you know you know certainly open for discussion. Um, and then um, you know, but there's also sort of practical elements which are are November town meeting that warrant probably closes first week of September or somewhere in that somewhere ballpark. Yeah. yeah. So um, I mean, uh, you know, if this was something that the, the committee had energy about, we probably that need to move quickly. I think that August 27th they're talking about that warrant at the select board. Too, so it might be yeah. that night. I'm not sure. Not yeah. Sure. So like, if we theoretically wanted to try and do this for November, for instance, which would we'd have to do to support this budget cycle. Um, we'd have to move pretty quickly and ask the select board to put something on the warrant. Yeah, so that timing may not work, but I don't want to lose the idea of it doesn't work. Yeah. I think, are you I thinking think for fiscal 20, or are you thinking for the coming up in finance form for the for fiscal 21? For 21. So yeah. that budget gets approved as part of April um, town meeting. The, the November town meeting is usually a subsequent town meeting where we make modifications. It could be there, but I would think that that would actually affect the current year. Anything that happens on fis at November town meeting's floor is going to affect fiscal 20. If your intent is for this to be something that you want to put in play for 21, I think you have more time than you think because yeah, that would be a good point. Town meeting. Yeah. It would definitely be something that Bob would need to be fully aware of, and we'd have to do some research on how would we even set this yeah, up. Yeah. It's not even something I'm aware that any community does. For sure. Would it be set up as a stabilization fund? How would we have to set this yeah. up? I, there'd be a lot of consulting, but he'd even need to build it in somehow to all the presentations to, to bring it up to town meeting yeah. and get it approved. So you yeah, might I think the review board would have to be when it's income because we don't have the knowledge and background and wherewithal to understand some of the functions and whether it was feasible, some of the things people were proposing. I feel like it would have to be vetted a little at a you know, department level. Well, the, the way that I would sort of see it playing out would be, um, you know, we, we go through budget presentations with the schools and with the town, right? They also do those with the select board and with the school committee. We join, we jo typically we join those, right? Uh, or some subset of us join those. I think it would be part of that presentation. Here's here's the budget. Here's the page on the budget that's dedicated to sort of ideas for fiscal sustainability or whatever. Um, maybe you know Bob puts his thumb on the scale and says this is the one we think is the highest potential and the one we're making you know we're, we're requesting right or not we're not I don't, I don't know. Because um, right, I want them. I want Bob yeah. and Dr. Dorothy to edit it first. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. All all I'm saying is that yeah. just purely you know pragmatically it's a it's a warrant article in, involving the spending of money so fincom is going to have to make a recommendation for for this each town meeting i would think the only other thing to caution and jan i know you tell us this every year economy's good everything's up as soon as that flips which could be a year i mean let's just be i'll be honest right could be a year could be two if we're not really generating free cash, this is the, I know, I'm hoping it's longer, but that's the time where, and like, no one's going to go for this, then I, 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 I'm not sure I would. <laughs> you don't need for our budget cuts, well, and this gets scrapped. We said a million, but we could, could we scale to the economy, so. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying, it could be. I'm just saying, I think that you lose support quickly in those out Long years time. where yeah. things don't look as rosy. That's my only other caution, is that. So where do you go together and create this idea in order to prepare that? Because like you said, well, well, we essentially want to act small and think big, right? So yeah. um, is this the forum that we come up with those ideas? Do we, you know, the next meeting collect those ideas? Do you talk to Bob with those ideas? And so I guess it, that's, because uh, it's, it's really what you're looking at is long range town development, right? And, and reduction of costs. Mm -hmm. um, so I would assume that would involve Bob and um, some other key we did have a, of the town. an email with Bob regarding this. Yeah, yeah, Bob has and, at least seen that. And they had talked yeah. about that in the past we've done things where we've done energy improvements. Right. The, I was going to say, so, yeah, so they all have to be like cost reduction. It can be how yeah, we're we've done certain energy in. improvements that save us in the long run, yeah. and yeah. that's a one time yeah. thing. It sounds like we're proactively planning this right now based upon what you guys just talked about. So, is there something that do we, do we want to take this a step forward and, and well, talk about ideas? Or? Well, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think it's on us for it's on us no, to talk about the specific ideas. I mean, I, I, I would, um, you know, I mean, something like the energy improvements are like one-off. You know, there's this thing, 
we can case for it, right? You know, versus sort of uh, the way that I would think about it, and, and to Mark's point about what happens when the, when the economy turns, I think you want to create a culture around thinking about medium and long term fiscal sustainability versus being reactive to the economic conditions of the day. And, and, I, and I'd like to I'd like to believe that even in a difficult economic environment, we can convince people that spending a million dollars over five years for $2 million of cost savings over the next 10 is worth it, right? Even in a difficult fiscal environment. So, um, you know, when, when you say what you said, Mark, what that says to me is like, oh, move quickly because you want to get the thing, you want to get the thing approved and start, the, start that sort of process before the economy turns and then the... Oh, no, 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 I was saying let's think long term about setting this up. If we're going to take the time to do this yeah. and, and spend, yeah. you know, some good time from, you know, from people, let's make sure that it can survive. Because yeah. I do love the, I do yeah. like the idea, ultimately I like the idea, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm pushing on different things here just because I think yeah. just it's points for discussion, yeah. but not... I ultimately do like the idea, and 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 so so that that concern you have is is why when I initially thought about you know what would you do with a million dollars say you think of a five year yeah. two hundred thousand dollar pool um, the notion there would be that um, you know by the end of that five years or whenever you think, sort of evaluate whether or not to re up the fund theoretically independent of what the economic the our overall fiscal condition is mm. you have results that you can point to right you can say this this thing is delivering on what we said it was going to deliver and so there's a case to continue funding it even if it, it you know even if it's more difficult this year than it was five years ago yeah so no I do I like the idea I really do I don't think it's I don't think it's a bad idea I just think I don't know I just don't I really do. Yeah. We put this on the agenda maybe for the next this been coming, but invite, well, of course, Bob uh, will be right. here. Bob will be here. Bob will be here. Dr. Dory or Superintendent. I'm curious to have another open discussion. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Because I do, I like the thinking, too, because of the position we're in with free cash, is how do we best spend that in to make a more sustainable operating budget. And I'm always thinking of a wedge because now we've got some of the excess money because we've got the full tax levy. So what are some things we can be spending now that will save us down the road? And I mean, I think it, it gets back to Ed's point about messaging, right? We, we've got this cushion. Where, where are we, 12%? Or, or we're going to be there or higher north of that soon? And Sean laid out three ideas, and I like the third one the best. And it, it, it's, you know, it's it's investing this now with an eye towards sustainability. Um, there's a lot of details to work out here, but the, the kernel of the idea, I think, is solid. Well, and, and it gets back to, you know, you know most of us are listening, you know, started getting engaged you know, right a few years prior to the override. You know, this, I think, in the end, starts to deliver <coughs> further on that promise. Mm. And I think that's the other, you know, the other side of this as well, is that, you know, it's you know, the folks that are engaged and are paying attention are paying attention. Yeah. And so this is another way to say, okay, well, and it gets back to how you started it. This is, you know, we have this extra for some of those reasons when yeah. we predicted it. It didn't, you know, quite happen from a timing perspective, but we're not just sitting on our hands yeah. and just letting it go. Um, I think that, that that's, I think the, the, the genius in it is is being able to be able to, um, to deliver that message, and I think that's what will help, um, you know, kind of get, you know, uh, buy-in and yeah, my, my sort of shorthand way of thinking about it was, you know, we've got this excess from the override. Well, what's the best way to spend it? It's saving off the next override, right? Well, that's, that's, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly it. Because you'll, your I mean, we'll all hear that. Yeah. You will all hear yeah. that in whatever town conversation, yeah. neighborly conversation that you have is, well, what, you know, when's the next one coming? And then that's the, I, I, you know, again, this is, you know, something would be great to be able to point to saying, well, this is, you know, we're doing all of these types of things in yeah. the town. I think it's really interesting to find out what the stuff from Dr. Dory and, and Bob really, you know, what, what, what's, what's there that they haven't always thought about or communicated because they haven't, you know, pulled back that curtain to, yeah. be able to, to look at that. that, that I think that, that's the part that's fascinating is the ideas you know, that are there that, are just, that have been just out of our side. So the way forward on this, so I like the idea of at, a, at one of our meetings soon, just having another conversation with the town manager, with the superintendent, maybe with some heads up as the, you know, so they, sorry, maybe come in with some ideas potentially, or just, just have an open conversation. Um, 
what else is there is there an engagement with the select board this early do you think it's, it's I think we probably have another conversation involved Bob in the conversation yeah. that could guide next steps, I think. Right, and if it's not that, is there other fun is there other spending we could do now that would relieve some of the operating budget in the next five to ten years? I think our next meeting is September fourth. And I think that might be a meeting that I might be covering because Bob might be away December 4th or 5th or something of that nature. So that might not be the meeting that you talk about <laughs> if you want to have Bob up. Maybe I'm wrong then. Is it the... I wanted to say it was the 4th or the 5th. I feel like oh, it was well, the 4th. I just thought, I just have to read current at the second Wednesday, so uh, maybe, we, maybe it's... I have us on the 4th. Oh, okay. I want to say yeah. that that's... Thanks very much, Brian. Take care. That is the meeting that Bob had said that he had something else prior engagement that I would probably be covering. Okay. So that might not be the one we have given us an opportunity to involve in that conversation. So we did, oh, we did schedule last time. Oh, that's right. Okay. Last, last meeting. Do, can we? Got the schedule somewhere. You have, you have the schedule? Look at that. Maybe we can send that. Maybe we could email that out. Look at that. So, I think, I think it got mailed out earlier in yeah. July. Yeah. You, did, you did email it out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the fourth is the next one. Then we have two financial forums, by the way. Yeah. All right. Which is a departure. Usually there's only one. Polly, you're going to chair the 18th because I won't be here. Why are we having two? I didn't know I wasn't here for the discussions. Uh oh. You're not here. <laughs> did you just swear? Eric, why are we having two financial projects? Bob had proposed one's, one's capital projects, uh, just because of everything going on, right? One's the, the one on the 18th is, is talk about capital projects, kind of that kind of that town conversation engagement. And then um, the, eight, the October 16th is more the traditional budget guidance and yeah, conversation. I mean, at town meeting, Bob committed to quarterly sort of updates on the on the building security project and I think that's what he's okay. yeah. targeting for that discussion okay. primarily. Sorry, for the last yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah so I, I, I sort of get the quarterly updates, but I often find, especially when things are going well, which they are now financial forms don't have a lot of meat to them. So I don't want to, I'd hate to do two and have four tens both versus one. Mm. It's because they've <laughs> got a lot of capital going on in terms of turf two, the no, building security project. They, they've got a lot going on. Maybe he thinks yeah, it requires I more time. I, I don't know. I, I, he didn't know. Which I think that would be a great meeting. I th think the next one would be like, oh, well, I don't know if there's a lot of meat to the next one. Oh, I see. Well, right. so that, that's covered in the category. All right, so, okay, let's make the assumption. Okay, the assumption, this is this year, 3.25%, you know. Yeah. So yeah. just just from a timing perspective, I don't know that you, we have to wait till October to have traditional financial forum because we won't know free cash until then, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't know that Bob, I mean, it will have already been six months since town meeting if we wait till October. So I, I think... Bob That's him trying feels, to get that quarterly one in. He probably feels a crunch to get it in, yeah, by the you know, by the end of the third quarter basically. Um You're probably right. Yeah. Well, we can reach out and talk to him. Um but back to the the idea of the table then it sounds like Bob's out the fourth. That, yeah, I wanna say that's the one that's on my calendar for me to cover and he will not be here. Or he thinks he won't be here. I can double check that whatever it is has it clear on his calendar. Yeah. Oh, you could put it on the agenda for the eleventh. What's the eleventh? Isn't that the isn't that the other meeting? Is it the fourth and the eleventh? We don't we don't no, have we have nothing for the eleventh. I just created a recurrent second Tuesday yeah. of the month. Oh, okay. So that's where it hit. Maybe we have another. I mean I, I hate to throw another meeting there, but instead of or in, yeah. Can we reschedule the fourth? We could reschedule the fourth. My hesitation there, I think it's okay, is generally that meeting before the financial forum is used to prep for the financial forum to some extent, just kind of what we're going to cover. But, it, you know, it just gives us a little less time, but I think it's fine. 
Why don't we touch base with Bob? I can touch base with Bob. Yeah. Yeah. That's Dave, just to confirm he's out the fourth. If so, maybe we can move to the eleventh. Because I'm sure 11th. you know when I have this conversation with him. If Absolutely. This yeah. And then we can also um, make sure Dr. Doherty could attend. Although, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sean. Sure. Yeah. We have the instructional motion. Um, I'm not sure how media of a discussion that's going to be. I'm looking at the time. It's 940. What, what, is, do I have a sense from the committee as to whether we want to take that up tonight or potentially postpone that discussion? The instructional motion from town meeting around unused debt and potentially developing a policy on how to how to handle unused, authorized, oh, authorized, but unused debt. Yeah. I'd rather not do that tonight. Yeah. That's just my opinion. It's getting kind of late. Yeah, in general, what I found is I only found one other community that actually has a policy. That has a policy. Um, we don't have a lot of outstanding debt. Um, the only two things that weren't off right between the last two town meetings is um, something that's back in 2013 that's been rescinded in November. And the Birch Meadow Lighting Project, which is the one that was the source of the yeah. issue. Um, that Birch Meadow Lighting Project was authorized in uh, 2015. Um, it was supposed to be to light five fields. When we went and got the bid, it, the numbers came up higher than what we had authorized. And we were it was clear that we were going to have an override coming. It was not good timing. We tabled the whole project and pushed it out. Um, and then Turf 2 um, became a high priority based on safety concerns. You can know, replace a field, it makes sense to put the lighting with it, but Turf 2 was part of that original authorization, and so I think, I'm not sure if, if feeling at town meeting is that we were trying to hide that, but there isn't enough money in that authorization to do the project. It's certainly something we have to revisit um, with the remaining four fields as we get to a point where we're able to consider that project. And also something to note, I don't think I put it in the write-up, is when we go to issue debt, there's more to it than just your debt authorization. They want to see that it's in the capital plan and that town meeting knows when it was supposed to happen. It's not currently, but that, that's not out there. Um, that Birch Meadow is not sitting out there in our current year and the next year. So we would not be able to borrow it. Just because the authorization is out there does not mean that we can borrow it. We have to have everything lining up because bond council is not going to issue the bond unless we can show that we have all the appropriate votes. It is in our capital plan. It is very clear when this was going to happen. So having the authorization to me never really seemed as a risk. We were not going to borrow for it because we weren't doing the project. It's just sitting there, waiting for us to be ready, waiting for us to revisit it. The only thing that looks strange about it is Turf 2 was part of that. And we kind of carved it out to do Turf 2 by itself because there was a need there. It makes sense to like the field when you're doing the field. Um, so it wasn't meant to be less than transparent, but it's one of those things that that's probably how it looked. We do resend our debt on a very regular basis. In your packet, you will see that there's very little debt out there authorized. Um, so it's a matter of, for the next meeting, if we're going to postpone it to the next meeting, we have to talk about, do we want to add something to our debt and capital policy that talks about if something is authorized, how long can it be up there before it has to yeah. be retaken re re up at town meeting? That's what I thought they were asking. I'm not, I wasn't there the night. It was yeah. also just like a review. Like, at what, you know, the thing club should periodically review. Yes. Even if it's just asking you the question. Yeah. yeah. Think like more. Yeah, I, I think it could be a pretty light touch. Educated. I don't. I, I mean, I saw the you had the um, the Stoughton thing in here that was like an automatic sunset clause. Yeah. I think that's definitely a heavier touch than what the instruction instructional motion had in mind. But that was the only community yeah. that came back to me and said, "Yes, I have something like this. This is what it is." Do we it's not the common. Item? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Do we have the explicit instructional motion? I actually don't have it with me. Yeah, do you I don't have it, um, Jackie? No. no. All right. Maybe maybe we do postpone. Yeah. If unless anyone yeah. has a different viewpoint, we and we'll, we'll get the actual, the actual motion and then we can take yeah. it up at the next meeting. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I do just one last thought on this. I do think the outcome could be as simple as like a line we add to the debt and capital policy, right? That says yeah. FinCom shall review all debt authorizations else, you know, more than X years outstanding, right? And something as simple as that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it just essentially kind of keeps us honest about 
should this still be on there or should we go to town meeting and look through some I think they part? want to see if we wanted to just go back and rescind that and just when we're ready to go for the project mm -hmm. reauthorize it, it again right, and that's I'm always an option it was something that we actually entertained the possibility of doing and then we said well we still <coughs> want to do that project to rescind it as if to say it's not needed it's still needed we just need a little bit more money and we would probably readdress that authorization but to Sean's so, point if it's oh, yeah sorry. so yeah. that's all that 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 was the thought process and yeah. leaving it there but to look at the list of what we keep out there debt authorizations we keep a very clean list yeah. so if there's something that is done it is rescinded if there's money left over we move it so we're we're not we're not trying to be less than transparent. There is quite a bit of activity that is shown to town meeting. This is left. This is being rescinded. Res debt rescinding is happening all the time at town meeting. So it's not something like, well, we never see them rescind debt. We are doing that. So it's just one of those things where to see this come up, it almost makes you feel like people don't think we're doing what we're supposed to do, but they are voting it. They are approving it. So it is one of those hard right. things it's to see come up. It's an interesting conversation then for the town meeting. Maybe some of it we didn't know they have to know some of the answers. So I think we can yeah. have a clean response, but I think we should just do it. But it's certainly up to you guys if you want to modify that debt policy to include a line that says something about how often you maybe look at them or maybe that we, if it's out there X number of years, it should be revisited by the town mm -hmm. meeting. But I couldn't find any other examples except for Stoughton of any community that mm -hmm. So yeah, that doesn't help us much. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, can I have a comment? Please. Uh, yes. Uh, that was before my time, but I did my own research on that specific instruction also. And the way that I see it, there was a change in scope for that authorization. So when the board, mm -hmm. board council sees a change in scope, they never will go through the following for that. Plus, you have that extra layer that it has to be in the capital plan. If it's not in capital plan, you can't borrow. The bond is not going to It's the same. That tells so you the timing. So what yeah. Shannon and I do, uh, when we go to borrow, we have that extra layer there that bond council will provide a list of things that we have to provide to them. One of them is, is it in the capital plan? If it's not there, they're going to say, you can't borrow. You need to go back to tell me. So even though it's authorized, yeah. It's just link. It's like you know, limbo stage. You can't do anything. It's authorized. You cannot borrow that money. Yeah. yeah I, to so me, to me when the, there is a change of scope, yeah. and it's a broader, you, you're going to borrow for more things. Yeah. You just leave it there. It's, it's that's my heart. That's my heart. Yeah. I, I guess the counter argument is, is a change of scope, and you're not going to be able to spend it anyway. What's the point of leaving the authorization outstanding, right? It just confuses the issue because then people don't understand. Well. You're asking me to fund field lights, but I thought field lights were in this thing. That there's another depth, right? I mean, we just we saw that confusion come out. The second piece of it is, and and I I hear your point, Sharon, that it feels like there's like a lack of trust as a result of that. Um, you know, I was when we when this first came up, Bob told. Uh, Bob told, I think, us in our pre-town meeting meeting or something, he told us that you do this periodically anyway, and that's part of why that's going to be on November on the November warrant, um, which was encouraging and good to hear. You're not always going to be the town accountant. There's going to come a day when you're not. So a policy would be, uh, I think the idea of the policy would be to say, this is just something we should be in the habit of doing regardless of who the decision makers are. Yeah. Right. And, and, and more than a lack of trust, the way I feel it came up was we want to redo on this. We town meeting. And we don't feel lot, like I knew a lot of people were sort of like we voted this for lights too. You know, um, they didn't so remember. Think, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then once, so I don't think it was trust. I think it was like we want to redo. Yeah. Well, we I feel like I feel like it got left there for the the reason that town meeting voted that they wanted those lights. We couldn't afford them. The timing was poor because we were going for an override. We just didn't think the timing was right to proceed with the project at a higher price, right? But we know that the town still wants those lights. It's just the timing has to be right. So most times when we're rescinding something, it's because it's never going to get done or it's all done and this is the remainder. This was kind of questionable because we're saying let's revisit this authorization altogether, not say let's just take it away never going to do it. And I feel like it almost gives that impression when you say let's rescind the whole $900,000 like this project's not happening. So and there, it's just, so it's hard because in in it's not typical that we're taking something completely off the books and something that we intend to do at some point. 
because there isn't a limit on when the authorization has to go away. Do you know what I mean currently? Um, and so if it's already out there, then you can refer back to it. Back in 2015, we approved these lighting, this lighting project. When we got the bids, they were higher than we expected. The project had to be tabled, could not be done. Since then, we've carved out one lighting project that had to be done as part of the redo of a whole field. It made sense to do the lights there. Well, now you want to get four, so you would address that as part of that town meeting. But we're going to need to go to town meeting to ever do that project. Mm -hmm. But to rescind it almost is to say it's never going to happen. And there are people who voted at town meeting that said they wanted it. Do you know what I mean? So or would you do it at? Would you do it? Uh, at the same time, you, it's, you're making an excellent point. Would you say part of this is we're going to kill this part, and here's our new one for this new project in this yeah, new market? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so then yeah. that would be very or, clear to everyone. Or if it's clear for town meeting, because it was never the intent to make anybody feel like we're trying to be less than transparent, just rescind the whole thing and then we'll revisit it. And that right, can the language fresh. in the article say just get rid of it, and then we will ask for it again when we're ready to do the project. As I said, bond council looks at everything. You have the authorization, but I need to see in your capital plan where it shows. I want to see where the debt payments land up. There's checks and balances that town meeting doesn't see. Good that knows that there, there's no way we could borrow that money, even though the authorization is sitting out there. I guess we should sure. keep discussing it. It's yeah. next meeting. <laughs> okay. Okay. So next meeting. Next meeting. With the fourth, you'll let us know. So next meeting could potentially be moved to the 11th. Does that present a conflict with what they know of right now? September. Yep. I may be out of, <clears throat> I may be out of town that week, but that's uh, okay. to be determined. But it's uh, it's either that week or the week after. So. Okay. Okay, let me let's get in touch with Bob and we'll see how it how it shakes out. Yep. Okay. And does everybody have the schedule for the year? Jackie has emailed it out, but um, I don't I don't think I got I know, so but I'm sure I got it. So what would it go out with? Uh, Bob I actually think sent it out. Maybe Bob oh, did. Bob's would you, yeah, could we, we just publish it again? It again. Well, he published yeah, yeah. this meeting date. I, know. I think right. yeah, I, I, I remember I getting it from Bob, Bob, not from Jackie. Yeah. It was like an email where it's right. a person. What you say? Different persons. All right. So I think that brings us to the minutes. I want to thank um, Sharon and Andrew for coming out tonight. Uh, you worked all day and then come out and talk about this with us. Um, but it was very helpful um, just for us to level set. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the committee for a good, um, good engaging discussion. So. We just have to approve the minutes. We have approved the minutes. And so these were the minutes from, let's get there. Last meeting. Last meeting, which was July 1st. Give everybody a minute to look over if you need to. Thank you, Andrew. Would entertain a motion when ready. approves the minutes of July 1st. I'll second. Further discussion? You can vote even though you are not president at the meeting. Uh, whether you do is up to you. Yes, this is the says you can't abstain. You can't abstain. So all those in favor? I believe it's unanimous 8-0. You got something from Bob. And you were probably away yeah. somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have I, I have a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Did I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.